Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about one of the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve it. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. I've known Ben Garfinkel personally for a number of years now and can attest that he is both an incredibly bright and an incredibly funny guy. At EA Global 2018, he gave a talk called How Sure Are We About All This AI Stuff, which created a bit of a stir. It threw a bit of cold water uh, on some popular arguments for why artificial intelligence should be uh, regarded as a particularly valuable thing to work on. It's really great to see someone going back over classic arguments that are often repeated but seldom scrutinized uh, to see whether they really hold up to the best counter arguments that they can think of. Ben actually supports the continued expansion of AI safety as a field and believes working on AI is among the very best ways to have a positive impact on the long-term future. But he also thinks that many of these familiar arguments for focusing on AI and how safely it's developed are weaker than they look, and at least need further development or clarification to patch them against counter-arguments. Naturally, uh, all of us were keen to interview Ben to see where his thinking on this topic had gotten to. We ended up sending my colleague Howie Lempel to Oxford to do the interview, and he did a great job. Uh, in fact, a few of my colleagues said even though it's only Howie's second interview, they thought it might be their favorite episode yet, which I guess I'll try not to take too personally. Ben didn't feel right uh, jumping to objections before properly outlining the case in favor of the importance of uh, artificial intelligence uh, playing a really important role in shaping the future uh, and giving that case its due. So the first 45 minutes are a pretty careful outline of different aspects of that case, uh, some of which regular listeners uh, might be familiar with. There's important new ideas and details in there, uh, but if you feel like you've heard the case for working on AI enough times uh, already uh, and could recite it back at this point, you might like to skip to the discussion of uh, how sure are we about this AI stuff. And you can do that by selecting the chapter titled uh, Brain in a Box in your podcast software or just navigating 50 minutes into the episode. We'll link to some articles and presentations uh, Ben has made on this topic in the show notes. And if you care about this issue, uh, I do recommend checking them out uh, even more than I normally encourage people to look at all those extra resources. Before that, uh, let me give you a quick reminder about our job board, uh, which you can find at 80,000hours.org slash jobs. It's a short list of jobs that we're especially interested to see people consider applying for, and it might be able to help you find the best opportunity to have a larger positive social impact uh, or save you dozens of hours uh, searching for opportunities on your own. Every few weeks, Maria Gutierrez uh, does the enormous work of checking hundreds of organizations' vacancies pages and a range of uh, other clever sources that she's found uh, so that you don't have to do all that work. As a record, this, there's 496 uh, vacancies listed uh, on there across a wide range of problems, including AI, but also biosecurity, COVID-19, ending factory farming, global poverty, priorities research, uh, improving governance, uh, and more. There's also many roles that are less there so that you can immediately do good uh, and more because they'll leave you in a better position to get higher impact senior roles uh, later on. You can use the filters to see just the vacancies that are relevant to the problems you want to work on uh, or positions suitable for your field of expertise uh, and level of experience. That's 80,000hours.org slash jobs. If you'd like to get an email each few weeks uh, when we update the jobs board with 100 or 200 or so new positions, uh, you can sign up either on that page or at 80,000hours.org slash newsletter. All right, without further ado, here's Howie Lempel interviewing Ben Garfinkel. Today I'm speaking with Ben Garfinkel. Ben graduated from Yale University in 2016, where he majored in physics and in math and philosophy. After university, Ben became a researcher at the Center for Effective Altruism and then moved to the Center for the Governance of AI at the University of Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute. He's now a research fellow there. In addition, he recently started a DPhil in international relations, also at Oxford. Ben's research is cross-disciplinary, including work on AI governance, moral philosophy, and security. He's published research on the security implications of emerging technology with Alan Dafo, who Rob interviewed back in episode 31. And he was a co-author on an important group paper about potential malicious uses of AI. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Ben. Oh, thanks for having me. Okay, so we're going to focus today on talking to Ben about AI risk. But just to get started off, what are you working on right now? Yeah, so I um, sort of have the bad habit of sometimes working on a couple of different projects that aren't very related. So just recently this term, I started a PhD program in international relations, where I'm potentially doing some work related to the decline of war hypothesis or questions around, you know, how likely another large war is in the future. And the past couple of years, I've done a lot of work around basically trying to think about the long run implications of progress in artificial intelligence and different risk opportunities that might emerge from that. And then I've also done just problematically very unrelated things on the side as well. 
just an example of something that I recently spent a couple of weeks on, not necessarily for extremely good reasons, is I ended up getting kind of accidentally sucked into questions around what long run economic growth has looked like. My long run, I mean, like, since the Neolithic Revolution, like 10,000 years ago, long run, because there's this pretty influential paper from, I think, the mid 90s by Michael Kramer, who's this Nobel Prize winning economist that argues that a large part of the reason why growth is way faster than it used to be is that there's this interesting effect where when you have a larger population of people, you know, since there's more people, there's more potential opportunities for people to generate ideas that then, you know, increase productivity. You have this interesting feedback loop where um, the higher productivity is, the larger population you can support, and the larger population you can support, the quicker people can come up with ideas that increase productivity. And so for most of human history, supposedly, there was this interesting feedback loop where growth kept getting faster and faster as you had this sort of more people, faster productivity growth, higher productivity, more people feedback loop. And that's why, you know, growth is so much faster today than it used to be. And you know, for just every reason, getting like very interested in whether this is actually true and spending a bunch of time reading, you know, <laughs> various like economic historians, many of whom are sort of skeptical of it, and then sort of ended up going into these sort of recently generated archaeological data sets that are meant to try and estimate populations in different regions at different times on the basis of charcoal remains and things like this and trying to see like, oh, if you try and run the analysis on more recent, more accurate data, do you still get the same output out? And like, what's going on with statistical, whatever. And, you know, I, don't, I have a really great explanation of why I was doing this, but this, this is in fact something that I recently spent a couple of weeks on. So I assume that you now know what the causes of economic growth are? Uh, yeah, just, I just completely just... Yeah, it's, I'm planning on I'm publishing a blog post soon that will clear it up. Okay, well, I wouldn't want to preempt your blog post, so <laughs> I won't force you to solve economics for us today yeah. on this podcast. Yeah, but definitely forthcoming soon, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, all of the listeners can be really excited for that. But in the meantime, you spent most of the last couple of years working on some research on long-run implications of AI and so do you want to give a sense, you know, pretend I'm someone who's never really thought about AI before. Why would I think that this is one of the biggest priorities? Right. So I think just as we start, I think there's this pretty high level abstract argument you might make. And your argument, I think, is a few steps. So the first one is, you know, if you're trying to decide an area to work on or an area to focus policy on that might just really matter, then a good thing to look at is, does this issue plausibly have implications that matter not just for the present generation, but also for future generations? And this is obviously something that, you know, not everyone always takes into account. But for example, you know, various issues like climate change, this is one of the main motivations, like, oh, the effect could carry forward into the future. And then if you're trying to think, okay, maybe I'm interested in issues that, you know, maybe matter for the long run future, maybe matter for future generations, then it seems like one natural place to look at is technological progress. Because you're trying to pick out things that have mattered, that have had implications to carry forward into the future. Seems like historically, technology really pretty naturally falls into this category. You know, the world is super different today because we have industrial technology and electricity and agricultural processes and things like that. There's lots of technologies you can point to and say, oh, because that was introduced into the world, the lives of basically everyone who lived after that technology was introduced are very different. And then you can sort of look within technology, sort of ask, okay, like what technologies that are emerging today might really matter? What seems really salient? And I think there's, you know, a decent number of candidates here, but one that seems to stand out is AI. And the basic idea here is that it seems plausibly, you know, any given thing that humans can cognitively do using their brains can, you can, in principle, create some sort of AI system that can accomplish the same tasks. If you survey AI researchers and ask them, you know, do you think that we'll eventually have AI systems, at least in aggregate, can do pretty much all of the, the work that people can do. They typically say yes. Some of them even say they think there's, you know, a 50-50 chance within a century or I think even 50 years in, in one survey. And it seems like, you know, if you're imagining a world where, you know, AI systems can do, at least in limit, pretty much all the stuff that people can do or a really large portion of it, then whatever that looks like, that's a, that's a really substantially different world. And it seems like, you know, pretty worth looking at that and saying like, you know, what's going on there? What, what, what might those changes look like? Are they good? Are they bad? Is there anything we might do to shape them? I think that's a, that's a reason to sort of pay attention to AI, at least to begin with. Got it. So I guess that sounds like a reason to think that the development of AI might really change the world and that the world post-AI might look really different from how it looks today. I feel like it's a priority. You know, there also have to be things that we can do about it. So is there a reason to think that somebody, you know, who is working on AI today, you know, has a shot at affecting how this goes? Right. So I think that's that's basically a really important point. And I think that's one pretty significant objection you can raise, at least this sort of high level, somewhat vague pitch for working on AI. So just because something has some long run significance doesn't necessarily mean that you can do much to sort of affect the trajectory. 
So this is the quick analogy. It's quite clear that the Industrial Revolution is very important. The world is very different today because we have, you know, fossil fuels and electricity and large scale industry. At the same time, though, if you're you know, living in 1750 or something, you're trying to think, you know, how do I make the Industrial Revolution go well? How do I make the world better? Let's say in the year 2000 or even after that, knowing that industrialization is going to be very important. It's not really clear what you do to sort of make things go different in a foreseeably positive way. Or even more extreme case, it's really clear that agriculture has been a really important development in human history. But if you're, you're living in 10,000 BC, start of the Neolithic Revolution, it's not really clear what you do to try and make sort of a difference, make things sort of go one way versus another in terms of the long run impact. Do you have ideas at all for what our industrial revolution effective altruist would have tried to do? Yeah, I think this is pretty, pretty unclear. So I think something that's pretty significant about the Industrial Revolution is it really led to a divergence in terms of what countries were globally dominant. So England had this period of extreme dominance on the basis of industrializing first compared to the rest of Europe, and especially compared to Asia. And you might have certain views about maybe what country it would have been best to sort of be in a leadership role in that position. And maybe you could have tried to, let's say, help technology diffuse quicker in certain ways. Another attack you may have taken is so there's some arguments people make that speeding up economic growth has a positive long run impact. In that case, maybe you would have tried to like help things along, try to sort of help spread innovations quicker or yourself participate in it. I'm not really sure, though. I haven't thought too much about this scenario, but I suppose those are those are some attacks you could have taken. But I think even then it's a little bit unclear. So let's say, you know, England was really dominant in the Industrial Revolution, but already obviously 200 years later, its position has you know faded back quite a bit. And it's also not really that clear that, let's say, any individual, even large organization really could have made that much of a difference. Maybe just the institutions that were in place would have been very hard to change. And just it was a little bit determined it would go that way. So this is this open question about even if we agree that AI might be one of these potentially history changing events, similar to the Industrial Revolution, it's a question of can we do anything to affect those? Then there's like a specific question about in this instance, is this a good thing to work on? And so... Does the case for trying to affect the future by working on AI today depend on believing that the types of AI that might end up being industrial revolution level of impact are potentially going to be developed very soon? Or even if you think it will be like a longer time until we see those types of systems, you still think that this is a good time to be working on AI? So I think definitely thinking that interesting stuff will happen soon definitely helps the case for working on AI. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. So one reason is just there's this clear intuition that for lots of technologies, there's a period of time where it would have been probably just too early to have a large impact. So let's say that you are, you know, it's back in ancient Greece or something, and you've, you've noticed that certain eels are like electrified, and you have this sense of, oh, electricity is this interesting thing. Or you have some sense that, you know, there are magnetic materials, probably you're not going to have an impact on electrification in the 1800s and 1900s. Or, you know, in the case of AI, if you want to have like an impact on, let's say, policy decisions that are made today or policy decisions that are made by governments or companies like Google, if you're in the really, really early days of computing, you're in like the 50s or 60s, again, it's like a little bit unintuitive to me that you could really foreseeably influence that things that much. So definitely there's some intuition there. Another issue is that the further things are away, the probably like less of a sense we have what the shape of AI progress will look like. So if there are really large changes over the next two decades, then we can probably imagine that a lot of the technology that does this probably looks not that different than contemporary machine learning. Whereas if the changes that are really substantial mostly happen decades in the future, not that much interesting happens for the next two decades, then maybe it's, you know, the technology could just look quite different. The institutions could look quite different. And we just really not have a clear sense of what we even want to happen or um, even really have the right concepts for talking about AI. I should say, though, that I think there's also some case to be made for it being more useful to work on it early. So one potential reason is just if you're thinking about impacts that probably won't happen for a very long time, there are probably fewer people thinking about them. And so maybe you can have more influence. Maybe it's more neglected to talk about stuff that won't happen for a long time. And maybe there's especially a good opportunity to sort of set the narrative or sort of frame the issues before they become maybe politicized or, you know, something that's much closer to people's lives and much more sort of connected to, to present day issues. Do we have any examples of people affecting the development of technologies in this kind of way? you know, like a decade or more before the technology is developed? So I'm not very familiar. I think you're, you're probably more familiar with this case. But my impression is that as in the world of genetic engineering and biosecurity, people start thinking about ethical issues and potential risks quite early on in the field before they were really very present. And this has maybe been helpful for establishing norms in the community and setting up institutions that will be useful for new risks as they emerge. And so I'm not very familiar with that case, but it seems like plausibly one where it was good for people to you know, talk about something that wasn't really going to present itself for several decades. Yep, that seems like a good example to me. I am not as informed as I'd 
like to be about this case. But the quick summary is in the 1970s, a bunch of scientists got together to discuss the ethics of genetic engineering, sort of made some early on ethical codes that sort of they put together before there were going to be very big impacts from the technology. And I think some of the norms from those have managed to stick around. My sense is that some of them have become like a bit outdated, but are still seen as sort of like the go-to ethics. And you do definitely see some experiments that I think a lot of people find pretty dangerous that aren't covered by those codes. And so a little hard to say how helpful was it actually, but it seems at least like a good attempt. Okay, so one reason you might think to work on AI is by this analogy to the Industrial Revolution. We've only had so many events in human history that seem as though they really changed humanity's trajectory for a decent period of time. Seems like AI has the potential to be one of those technologies, be one of those transformations that might be a reason to think that affecting it could really change how well the world goes. Are there arguments that sort of engage more with AI as a specific technology for why we should think that AI might be sort of like one of these points where you could have a lot of influence? Yeah, so I definitely think there are a number of different, more specific arguments that go beyond just the point that AI could be really transformative. So I think the first one is that there are a number of arguments that progress in AI could be politically destabilizing in a number of ways. One class of concerns people raise is the concern that perhaps certain military or even non-military applications of AI could in some way raise the risk of, of war and especially war between, between great powers. And the basic idea here is it seems like, in general, the character of military technology might have some level of effect on the likelihood of war. And it's like one concrete example of this in the case of AI is a lot of people have this view, or it's sort of a conventional view, that it's stabilizing if, in the context of two nuclear powers, both powers feel secure and their ability to carry out a nuclear strike on the other power if they feel like a nuclear strike is you know, going to target them. So if you know, each power has the ability to retaliate credibly, then this creates a strong disincentive to initiate a war because both you know, nuclear powers know it's going to end badly for both sides if a war happens because it can both strike the other. And there's certain applications of AI that some people suggest might make it harder to credibly deter attacks of nuclear weapons. They might make it easier, for example, to um, locate the other size nuclear weapons in order to target them more effectively. Or, for example, you know, certain underwater drones that are autonomous might be able to more easily track nuclear submarines that belong to the other side. And so that's like one way in which, for example, AI could conceivably increase the risk of war is by making it harder for states to you know, deter attacks from one another. Or another sort of specific version of this is... People point at concerns that maybe if you introduce what are known as autonomous weapon systems, you know, systems that could plausibly kind of autonomously on their own choose to initiate force in certain circumstances, maybe that increases the odds of sort of accidental use of force that could, you know, spark crises. And maybe it means that crises could more quickly spin up into something much more extreme if, you know, systems can respond to other autonomous systems and a crisis gets really out of hand before any humans can actually intervene and really see what's going on. Or just maybe certain applications make certain forms of offense easier in a way that makes it you know, more tempting. And so there's sort of various concerns along these lines. And you know, even just aside from the fact that obviously war is really something that you'd like to avoid if you can. If you're taking, you know, again, this long-term perspective, you know, given the existence of nuclear weapons, it's relatively plausible that you know, if war, let's say, were to occur between great powers that and nuclear weapons were used, it's more plausible than it was in the past that this could actually be something that's, you know, really permanently damaging as opposed to something that, you know, is horrific, but isn't necessarily something that carries forward, you know, many generations into the future. Got it. And so if the mechanism that you're going for is reducing war or the likelihood of the likelihood, I guess, or impact of war or maybe in particular great power wars, is it clear that AI is the thing to work on? So yeah, I think that that is a really good question. So if, let's say, you decide that you're really just focused on reducing the risk of war, and especially war between great powers, then one point you can make is that, you know, there are multiple, you know, salient emerging forms of military technology. And another example that's not AI is hypersonic missiles, which are basically missiles that are believed to be much harder to defend against, that can essentially move faster and more easily evade defenses. And there's some suggestion that if you make missile defense much harder in certain conventional contexts, then this could increase the risk of war. If, for example, the U.S. comes to believe that, you know, it wouldn't be able to survive certain, you know, attacks by missiles in potential future conflicts with, let's say, you know, China or Russia. And, you know, I, I don't, I know extremely little basically about hypersonics, but it's not necessarily that clear to me that, you know, they're less potentially destabilizing than at least the applications of AI we'll see over the next, you know, couple of decades. And 
you know, I think it's a kind of a little bit of an open question I'm uncertain about of which of the, the suite of emerging military, military technologies matter most. You might also just think as well that maybe like, obviously changes in military technology are, you know, only one thing that accounts for a lot of the variation in the risk of war from one time period to another. Arguably, it's not historically been the main thing. You might also just be very interested in things like U.S.-China relations at like a high level or just, you know, what U.S. foreign policy is or who it is that gets elected. If you think that certain potential leaders, let's say, have a higher or like lower chance of initiating war. And there might just be lots of, you know, other interventions that plausibly are higher leverage than thinking about emerging AI applications of AI that might not really have entered the scene in a big way for, for you know, quite a while. Great. And so talk about political instability. The main mechanism that I picked up on was largely political instability leading to more wars and conflicts. Are there other reasons that from a long-term perspective, we ought to be worried about political instability? Yeah, I think, you know, maybe one pathway is domestic politics and in influencing international politics. I do think maybe a case could also be made that, you know, we have certain institutions that function, all things being considered relatively well at the moment. So there's, you know, a lot of democratic states in the world, lots of, you know, economic growth is steady. There's just various things that sort of are functioning relatively okay. And I guess you could also make an argument that if some of these institutions are damaged, maybe they're more fragile or more sort of rare than one might intuitively think. Yeah, and maybe you don't you know, come back in a form that you'd want in a sufficiently quickly. Or maybe just institutions working more poorly makes it harder for them to deal with other risks or issues that arise. But I think probably be the, the sort of argument you try to make here. As we've talked through some of the ways in which the development of AI could be a source of either potential conflict or other sources of instability. If someone were really concerned about one of these areas, do you have a take on what they ought to do about it? So I think it should definitely vary a bit area by area. I think one obvious general point is I don't think we have a very good sense on the nature or relative plausibility of a number of these, these different risks. So I think, you know, just a general like useful class of research is looking at some of these, these risks that people put forward and often, you know, have been put forward in, in the form of things like, let's say in the military context, things like War on the Rocks pieces or like short articles as opposed to really in-depth explorations. And just basically trying to understand the arguments better, trying to understand if we can learn lessons from history to figure out whether they're plausible or not, and just trying to get a sense of what we ought to be prioritizing. I think that's a general, you know, thing that applies to all of these. And then when it comes to the specific risk, I think, you know, again, it will vary a lot case by case. So just to take one example, if one thing you're interested in is maybe you think it's significant if, you know, AI misinformation damages political decision making or damages just like political processes in general, if you think that's, you know, potentially plausible, then potentially the thing you want to work on is, you know, maybe working on systems that are better able to distinguish fake media from real media or thinking of, you know, institutions you could put in place that could allow people to, you know, come to common sets of facts or things like that. I mean, obviously it's quite nebulous, but that category thing might be useful. Whereas if you're interested in, you know, risk of like great power war, then, you know, I think it's a little bit less clear what the interventions are, but you could just in general want to try and pursue a career in the you know, U.S. foreign policy or national security, you know, institutions, or just try and write pieces that, you know, potentially influence decision-making in a positive direction or help people identify what risks might be on the horizon. So moving on, we talked about how you had, I think, three reasons why it might be possible to have a positive influence on AI. We just talked about political instability. Do you want to move on to the next one? Yeah, so I think another argument you can make is that maybe certain decisions about the design of AI systems or about the design of institutions that handle them or you know, various other features of, of political systems might be sort of locked in at some point in the process of AI systems being developed and governed. I think some of the intuition here is that if you look through through history, there have been certain decisions or political outcomes that seem to have had a pretty stable lasting impact. So if you look at, for example, the history of the United States, the period of time where the US Constitution was being designed seems quite consequential. And it seems like lots of decisions that were made then have carried forward hundreds of years into the future and not just influenced US politics today, but also the political systems of other countries that have modeled themselves off of the US. Certain decisions about the design of technology also seem to have carried forward at least at the very least like decades into the future. So the, let's say the fact that Microsoft Windows is still like a fairly dominant operating system and has certain features and certain security flaws, it seems like there's some degree of path dependence there. But also in terms of the outcomes of certain competitions between different groups having relatively lasting impacts. We can take the example of, let's say, the post-World War II world order, where the U.S. obviously you know, emerged from that as a dominant power along with the Soviet Union, and then especially the U.S. has had a really large and fairly lasting impact on, on the global political system on the basis of that. And again, I think you know, some of the reaction to this is that it's quite clear that there's some things that sort of lock in about political systems for a long time or that lock in about the design of technology. 
And again, it's a question of exactly sort of how long this lock-in effect lasts. So even in the context of, let's say, design of a constitution, if we're thinking, you know, really, really long term, as opposed to focusing on, you know, present generation stuff, it still does seem like states typically have some, you know, sort of half-life. So, you know, Egypt was a really dominant power for, for a really long time, you know, thousands of years. And now, you know, obviously, ancient Egyptian culture mostly doesn't seem to have like a very large impact on the world. And it's really, you know, it doesn't seem like that much has really been locked in if you look thousands of years into the future. And I think similar for technology, it's, it's a bit hard to, I think, identify really consequential decisions that have made about, been made about technology that seem to have maybe gone one way or the other and have really stuck around for a long time. At least I'm not aware of, I think, any very clear examples of that. I guess another question I have here are for the examples of lock-in. So even during the period of time where the institution stuck around, it seems to me hard to decide to what extent were they leading to the their sort of original values being you know, more widely adopted? Like, were they actually doing their mission at that point? So the U.S. Constitution is still influencing the United States. How would the founders who wrote the Constitution feel about whether today's U.S. Constitution was sort of doing what they intended. So do you have a take on just how successful these sorts of institutions have been at not just locking in something, but like locking in the thing that they were aiming for? Yeah, so I imagine that there's, there's probably some stuff if you take the founding fathers and sort of time travel them to the present day. I imagine there's a lot of stuff they're probably really horrified about. Like the executive branch, for example, is probably a lot more powerful. But still does seem like there's some aspects of, you know, the Constitution that, so for example, just the, the fact that separation of powers continues to exist it seems like that's something that was very intentional and really core to their interest in designing the Constitution. And I imagine to be, you know, can you be happy that we continue to have these, these separate branches? Or I guess another example as well is, let's say, the, you know, warring states period, in like, you know, ancient China, with a number of different sort of philosophies proposed that were competing. And for example, Confucianism still today has a pretty influential role in like Chinese society and politics. I think people's interpretation of it's probably, you know, extremely different than it was at that period in time. I think the world is so different that's, you know, really ambiguous how to even really map it on. But I, I would tend to still think that if Confucius could sort of time travel into the present, he'd say that there's some aspects of society that are more what he would have hoped had, you know, Confucianism not caught on. Cool, that makes sense. So then maybe going from the historical examples of lock-in, there's an argument that AI in particular might cause lock-in. So what do we mean by that? What are like the ways in which AI might cause lock-in? What exactly might it be locking in? Yeah, I think that this is, I think that this is a little bit ambiguous. I think a couple of broad categories are, on the first part, laws and institutions that are designed to govern AI. So again, I think this is quite vague, but you might think that, for example, certain norms or even international agreements around, let's say, the use of certain kinds of AI systems in military context could emerge. There are people who are trying to explore this today. You might think that domestically, maybe certain governing bodies will be created that will have certain powers over, yeah, certain issues having to do with like software and machine learning. And so certain governing structures about sort of who has the sort of authority to pass or enforce certain regulations, that could be something that locks in. Or it could also just be certain norms about how AI is governed or used. I think those are things that could plausibly carry on for at least, you know, some long period of time. You might also think that there are certain design decisions that could be made about machine learning systems that could carry forward. I don't really have a very clear sense of what this would look like, but at least in the abstract, you could imagine that, you know, there's multiple methods you could use to create certain kinds of AI systems or certain, let's say, you know, minimum safety standards or things like this, or, you know, methods of, of testing things. You might think there are certain options and then eventually people sell on a certain way of doing things that could carry forward. Although I'm, I'm quite vague on what that would look like. So I guess for these examples, I'm not totally sure how to think about, like, extent to which they are important for the long-term future. It's certainly possible that the laws and institutions designed to govern AI today, really early on, could just have persistent effects, but I don't have a sense of whether or not I should think that these are going to keep mattering. Do you just have a take on, I guess, well, are there particular reasons to think that whatever framework is set up initially has like a really good shot at having lasting effects? And it's like, I don't know, how confident are you that in sort of some of these lock-in effects? So I would definitely say I'm not very confident that you'll have that many things that you kind of go one way or the other that will sort of lock in and be very important for a very long period of time. I do also though think there's there's probably another class of intuitions. If you look you know forward far enough and you're thinking about a world where we eventually approach the point where AI systems can just do all the stuff that people can do, that at that point, maybe there's some sort of, to some extent, people will be sort of embedding their values or the design of certain institutions into software and sort of stepping back from being in the loop to a large extent about sort of 
sort of stepping back from really active engagement in terms of economic or political processes. And so if you have the idea that in the long run, we'll sort of be in some sense passing off control or increasingly embedding values in institutions and software, then maybe there's some intuition that at that point, once you've sort of put this stuff into to code, that could be a lot more stable and a lot harder to change than traditional institutions or pieces of technology are. So I think there's that long run perspective. If you take that perspective, though, there's also the question of you know, if you think this would be a gradual process or if you think it would take us a really long time to get to that point, how much does that imply that stuff we do today will lock in? And that I'm a lot more unsure of. Okay, so we talked a bunch about the types of institutions that might create lock-in, but can you talk a little bit more about how concerned exactly should we be about this issue of lock-in, and what are some of like the bad scenarios that we want to avoid here? Yeah, so I think these kinds of concerns are definitely a lot more nebulous than concerns about, for example, the the risk of war increasing, where you know it's easy to paint at least you know a somewhat concrete picture of what that looks like and why it's bad. Whereas in the case of Locke, I think probably, I imagine people probably have typically much less specific concerns. I think, I think maybe the perspective to a large extent, you could base it on historical analogy. So one thought is that we've obviously seen lots of pretty significant technological transitions throughout history. And these transitions often seem to be in some way tied to shifts in political institutions or shifts in values or shifts in living standards. And often you seem quite positive. Like, for example, I would probably consider the Industrial Revolution positive on that. It seems to have been at least linked in some sort of way to, to obviously rising living standards and an increase in democracy and things like that. But there's also some that seem more negative. So often a perspective that people have on, for example, the Neolithic Revolution or the period of time where people first shifted from sort of hunter-gatherer societies to agricultural civilizations is that it seems like the shift may have had lots of downstream negative social effects. So one effect seems to have been to an increase in political and social hierarchy and move from collective decision-making to often autocracies. Seems to have led to a greater division in gender roles based on the sorts of labor that's relevant. Institutions like slavery seem to have become a lot more prominent as people sort of gathered in more dense communities, disease became being more salient, and living standards seem to have dropped. And a lot of this stuff seems sort of somewhat downstream of the shift to agriculture. Um, a lot of these effects seem probably quite difficult to have predicted ahead of time. Probably people weren't really aware that these shifts were happening because they were so slow. But this was just in some way sort of the natural course that things evolved into. And so you might, you know, when you look at the case of AI, you might just have this, this sort of background position of, okay, there's going to be quite substantial changes. Probably will have lots of political and social effects. And the historical record definitely doesn't say, oh, these are always fine. So you might just sort of begin with the suspicion, even if it's not very concrete, but Maybe there'll be some natural shifts here that, you know, if there's anything we can do to sort of, you know, prevent them from, from moving in a negative direction, anything we can do to sort of steer things more actively, maybe that's a positive dynamic. I do think there's also, I suppose, somewhat more, still like quite vague, but still somewhat more concrete concerns you might have. So again, if we're thinking, you know, very long term, we're eventually moving to a world where potentially, you know, machines can do most of the stuff that people can do or functionally all of it then in that sort of world, most people really don't have a lot of economic value to offer. You know, the value of their labor is very low. And maybe in a world like that, it's not that hard to imagine that that's bad for sort of you know, political representation. That's actually bad for living standards if people sort of don't have anything to, to, to sort of offer in exchange for income. Potentially just like there's lots of changes here that are just are very weird and, and not intuitively, intuitively positive. You might also think, for example, that there would be certain ethical decisions that we need to make, for example, about, you know, the roles of AI systems in the world, or even potentially in the long run, the moral status of AI systems. And maybe those decisions won't be made in, in sensible ways. And maybe there's potentially some opportunity for them to go one way or the other, and maybe just the wrong decisions will be made. Cool. So that's on the lock-in side. And I think you had a third category of arguments for why you know, the way that we handle the development of AI might have a big long-term effect. Yeah, so this is, there's a line of concerns that people have about sort of unintended consequences from AI development and specifically on the technical side. So there's a broad category of concerns that people have that will, in some sense, design AI systems that behave in ways that we don't anticipate and cause really substantial or lasting harm. And this is just, I guess, sort of sketch out this concern in very general terms. We know today that it's sometimes pretty hard to get AI systems to behave exactly as we want or avoid unintended harms, although they're often on you know, a relatively non-catastrophic scale. So we have examples of things like self-driving cars crashing, or systems are used to make decisions or inform decisions about, let's say, granting parole that have unintended sort of disparate harm effects on different communities. And there's sort of an intuition that as AI systems become more pervasive in the world, as they're involved in more and more consequential decisions, but actually more autonomous, and as they become more and more capable, that the consequences of these sorts of failures become more and more significant. 
And on the extreme end, you might make the case that, you know, if we're sort of imagining ourself as, ourselves as sort of gradually approaching this long run point in the future, where just AI systems kind of do most of the stuff, they're way more capable than we are at most tasks. And then maybe in that world, failures can actually rise to the level of being, you know, catastrophic or just really hard to come back from in some sense. So that feels like a good high level overview of reasons why you might be worried about unintended consequences from technology this powerful in general. But do you want to talk about some of the sort of more specific arguments that kind of give a sense of, you know, what we might be worried about going wrong with AI in particular? Right. So I think it's just been in say, the past couple of decades that people have started to really present more specific versions of this concern. Like you can go back and find early AI pioneers like Alan Turing and IJ Good sort of gesturing at concerns that maybe when we develop, you know, very sophisticated AI systems, we'll find it in some way hard to control their behavior and there may be negative effects. But it's really especially, I would say, mostly like mid-2000s, people like Eliezer and Nick Bostrom start to develop somewhat more specific category of arguments, sort of in detail, painting a picture of why things might go catastrophically wrong. And other people like Stuart Russell also sort of helped develop these arguments as well. But then since then, I'd say there's also been a less developed, but um, maybe the sort of newer category of arguments and some sense spinoff from the, let's say, bostrom Yukowski arguments. And Richard No, who's an AI safety researcher, actually has a really good blog post called, I believe, Disentangling Arguments for AI Safety. It sort of walks through the, I suppose, increasing, sort of increasing large sort of taxonomy of different arguments people have presented. And then you in particular... Your research has focused on just sort of one set of arguments, the, the sort of Bostrom, Yudkowsky line of argument. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you focus so heavily on that one in particular? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of reasons. So one reason is I think that these are still by far the, the most fleshed out arguments. So for example, um, like Bostrom, he has this book, obviously Superintelligence, that's been quite influential. That's a really long and detailed presentation of this sort of particular version of the iRisk argument. The book also contains lots of other, other perspectives on what the future of AI could look like, but they really are, you know, it's well more than 100 pages devoted to sort of exploring one relatively specific vision of the risk. And also, Ali Zyukowski also has a number of quite long essays. There's also a number of white papers put out by the Machine Intelligence Research Institute as well that explore the, the argument in a relatively high level of depth. Whereas some of these, these other newer arguments, really it's just, you know, will be a couple of blog posts or a single white paper presenting them. And often they're quite new as well. It's really maybe the past one or two years they've started to emerge. There's also just been a lot less vetted. So in, in some sense, just one argument is just, you know, it's much easier to understand what these arguments actually say because they've been expressed clearly and they've in some sense been vetted a bit more. Another reason to focus them on them, I think, is that they've also been a lot more influential. Like I think a lot of people who've decided to work on AI safety or get involved in AI governance from sort of a long-term perspective have been really heavily influenced by this particular set of arguments. I think still today, a lot of people who decide to transition to this area are influenced by them. So they're also kind of, I think, really concretely having an effect on people's behavior. So it's really important to understand you know, exactly how well they work or, or what the potential weak spots are. Yeah, and I think there's also the last one as well, is just, I think that these are probably the most sort of prominent arguments in terms of the extent to which AI safety concerns have filtered into public consciousness. I think the version of the concern that's mo mostly filtered in has been this particular version of it. So it's also useful from that perspective, you know, insofar as this is influencing public discussions to, to really have a clear sense of how strong these arguments are. Yeah, I suppose there's also just a last reason why I personally am especially interested in understanding the classic bostrom Yudkowsky arguments. And it's that these are actually, I suppose, the arguments that first got me really interested in artificial intelligence and really interested in the idea that this might be one of the most sort of high priority topics to work on. So it's actually specifically reading superintelligence is the first thing that got me, yeah, sort of into the area. And so I also feel from a personal perspective, I suppose, pretty interested in understanding, you know, how strong these arguments in fact are and, you know, how justified my, I suppose, it was for me to initially be quite convinced by them. And so all that's, that's you know, not to say that the the other newer arguments for AI risk aren't important to understand or, you know, plausibly correct. But I do think that there are currently some reasons to pay special attention to the, you know, the classic sort of bostrom Mikowski arguments and sort of prioritize examining them and valuing them over the, the newer arguments at the moment. So I think it'd be really valuable to sort of lay out both those sort of more fleshed out arguments in detail and also to talk and really dig in on the criticisms of those arguments that you've had and some of the sort of disagreements that you've had with that line of reasoning. So we're actually going to focus the rest of this podcast on that line of sort of classic arguments for AI risk in particular. 
So a lot of listeners might already be familiar with this Boston Mikowski argument, but do you want to give a quick high-level outline of exactly how that argument works? Yeah, so it is still like a decent amount of heterogeneity in terms of how this risk is presented by different people or how different people's vision of the risk has evolved over time. But still, um, even so, hopefully this will be a, a mostly representative sort of high-level gloss of the argument. And I think the first step is there's a suggestion that, you know, at some point in the future, we may create an AI system that's in some sense as smart as a person, like its cognitive abilities are very similar to that of a person. And then there's a, su- a suggestion that once we've done that, we might expect that system to be followed very soon after by a system that's in some sense much smarter than any person or any other AI system in existence. And some of the intuitive reasoning for that is, you know, imagine you have on a hard drive somewhere some system that can do anything that a human brain can do. Then you can do stuff like just run it on way more computing power so it can think way faster than any person can. Or you can allow it to sort of have a go at programming itself or changing you know, relevant code. And maybe there's some sort of interesting feedback loop there where as it gets smarter, it gets better at you know, doing AI research, which then makes it smarter again. And maybe there's some sort of explosive feedback loop there. But yeah, but it's basically various arguments people present for this sudden jump from something that's quite similar to a person to something that's in some sense radically super intelligent. And then there's a second bit to the argument that says, okay, well, how do we expect, let's say, a radically super intelligent system to behave? We should probably think of it as having some sort of goal or objective it's pursuing in the world. And there's a suggestion that most goals we might choose to give to advanced AI systems might be sort of subtly harmful or subtly diverge from what goals we'd give them if we really could understand all the implications of our requests. And there's a, this is a little bit abstract, but there's at least some kind of intentionally silly thought experiments that people sometimes present to, to make this intuitive. So one classic one is people imagine that there is some super intelligent AI system that's been given the goal of maximizing paperclip production for some paperclip factory. And at first glance, it seems like a really benign goal. This seems like a pretty boring thing. But if you follow through certain implications, and in some sense, you kind of put yourself in the shoes of an incredibly competent agent who only cares about paperclip production, then maybe there are certain behaviors that will flow out of this. So one example is from the perspective of this AI system, you might think, well, if I really want to maximize paperclip production, then it's really useful to, to seize as many resources as I can to really just plow them into paperclip production. Maybe just like, you know, seize wealth from other people or seize political power in some way. And just really, you know, plow everything I can into to just like clean out as many paperclips as possible. Or maybe you think, you know, oh, wow, once people realize that I'm just trying to do this horrible thing of just plowing the world's resources in the paperclip production, you know, maybe then people will try and turn me off because they realize, oh, that's actually not what I wanted. And then from that perspective, you have an incentive to try and, you know, stop people from turning you off or sort of really reducing people's power or even harming them if that reduces the risk of them standing in the way of you pursuing your single-minded goal of maximizing paperclip production. And so maybe this, you know, this horrible thing comes out of it. If you have this particular goal, we don't have these more nuanced goals about human values and sovereignty and things like that. And while no one presents these, I suppose, thought experiments as were intended to be, you know, realistic presentations of the concern, they're meant to illustrate this more general idea that supposedly most goals that you might give an AI system might have these sort of unintended consequences when pursued by a sufficiently competent agent, that there may be some sense in which most goals you might give an AI system just are subtly bad in ways that are hard to see. Cool. So no, there have been a, you know, a substantial number of people who have been somewhat convinced by this set of thought experiments and this argument, but there's also been a lot of pushback. So do you want to talk a little bit about the pushback that this has gotten, you know, in general from people other than you and, you know, why you think it's gotten so much pushback? Yeah, it, it, so it's a bit interesting. I think it's probably fair to say that a large fraction of especially machine learning researchers who encounter these arguments don't have a very positive reaction to them or sort of bounce off of them a bit, although obviously quite a few do find them sufficiently compelling to, you know, to be, you know, quite concerned. And I think often people don't really have, I think, very explicit reasons for rejecting them, or often at least people don't really write up, you know, very detailed, explicit rebuttals. I think often it's, to some extent, I think it's, it's a bit of, you know, kind of common sense intuitions. And I think one, for example, thing that people react to is that they're quite aware that a lot of the thought experiments that are used to illustrate the concern are very unrealistic. And even though even the proponents of the arguments agree that thought experiments are unrealistic, there's maybe something a bit, you know, suspicious about the fact that no one seems to be able to paint a picture of the risk that seems like really grounded in reality. And this doesn't really seem true of other risks that people worry about, like let's say, you know, pandemics or climate change or things like that. It is sort of distinctive that this is supposedly, you know, like a really large existential risk, but no one can really describe what, you know, the risk scenario looks like in quite concrete terms. I think that's one thing people react to. I think another thing that people sometimes react to is a lot of these arguments are presented in like fairly abstract terms using concepts like, you know, like goals and intelligence and other things like this that are a little bit fuzzy. 
And partly because when they were written, you know, often more than a decade ago, or, you know, at least more than five years ago, they don't really engage very much with what AI research looks like today. So today, most AI research or research that's labeled AI research is based on the machine learning paradigm. And for example, superintelligence really doesn't discuss machine learning very much. For example, there's a chapter on, you know, giving AI systems goals or loading values in the AI systems. And I believe reinforcement learning techniques only get about two paragraphs. And that's really the main sort of sec- set of techniques that people use today to sort of create advanced systems, which people see as sort of along the pathway to developing, you know, these really advanced agents. And so I think that's another thing is people sort of feel like, I don't know, it's not really directly speaking to what AI research looks like. And they feel a little bit uncomfortable about, you know, what are these kind of fuzzy abstractions? Like this, isn't, this maybe doesn't really fit with my picture of what AI research is. And I think maybe like a last one that maybe feeds maybe sort of just intuitive skeptical reactions is kind of a generic thing that I often hear people raise that like, oh, okay, well, you know, lots of technologies have safety issues, but typically we, we solve these safety issues or incentives to not have your technology do horribly destructive stuff. I think this is an argument that people like Stephen Pinker, for example, have made that, you know, there's really strong incentives for bridges not to fall down. So just kind of generically without looking too much in the specific argument, you should start from maybe a baseline of thinking, you know, incentive structures and feedback loops are such that for most technologies, safety issues are mostly prevented from being catastrophic. And maybe unless you really, really get convinced by strong arguments to the contrary, you should be inclined to think that in the case of AI as well. So I'm sure that you're aware of all these counter arguments at the time that you were, you know, really bought into super intelligence at the point where you were sort of making decisions about what to focus on based on it. So why didn't you find them convincing at the time? Yeah, I mean, I do think I, to some extent, did, did have these concerns, at least at a low level. So I definitely have always been come uncomfortable with the use of common intentionally silly thought experiments or like a little bit uncertain about the fact that no one could paint a very specific picture of the risk. I suppose the main reaction that I had, I think probably lots of people have, is that mainly these are arguments about, in some sense, what your prior should be, or like what sorts of attitudes you should have before engaging with the argument. So, for example, is the argument that generically before you look at the specifics of any given technology, you should have an initial expectation that probably, you know, most technologies end up having your safety issues resolved. So probably, you know, you should expect that to begin with. Or, um, you know, a prior that if an argument doesn't really engage very heavily with the technical details of a technology, then maybe there's some sort of sort of abstraction failure or something that makes your argument, you know, not really properly go through or grip onto reality. And, you know, I think that these, these sort of counters don't really, though, engage with the arguments themselves as much as they say why you should have an initial kind of tendency towards skepticism. But the thing that they don't do is actually look at the arguments in detail and then say, oh, you know, here's where the mistake is, or here's where the gap is, or here's where things somewhat come apart from the technical reality. And I guess it's, it's kind of easy to feel like, I guess a lot of critics don't actually really engage with the argument. So they don't really sort of make the effort to kind of take them seriously rather than just sort of waving them off on the basis of, I guess, sort of common sense, sense intuition. And so, yeah, I think in that, in that sense, it's kind of easy to dismiss critics as often just, oh, they don't really get it, or oh, they're not really like digging in, they're just being dismissive. So it's easy to dismiss them for that reason. Do you think it's also the case that some of them were kind of just being dismissive? I mean, I do think it's, it's a mix. I think I have pretty, pretty mixed feelings on this. So I think that a lot of these, these arguments are actually are pretty reasonable. Like, I do think you should be really suspicious if a realistic you know, vision of the risk isn't being painted, and you should be suspicious if the arguments don't seem to really grip on to, you know, the technical details, what the technology looks like. And, you know, you should be suspicious if it's, you know, the conclusion is something that's quite unusual if you just look at, you know, what's true of most technologies. And then, yeah, I think I really don't necessarily uh, begrudge anyone who's just like, they're busy to doing other stuff. They hear these arguments, they have this extremely strong prior that, you know, probably there's like something fishy here. And then, yeah, I basically don't think that that's very unreasonable. At the same time, though, I also think it's not necessarily unreasonable for someone who's convinced by your arguments to go, well, like, I understand why someone would react this way. But, you know, I've actually really looked into the arguments and I don't see the flaws. And so therefore, I'm going to continue to, to be convinced by them and not take the fact that people are intuitively dismissive without looking in depth into the arguments as like that much evidence against them. So I guess I'm, I'm maybe I'm sympathetic to both the people who um, react dismissively and the people who have ignored the fact that other people react dismissively. Yeah, I think another thing that I certainly felt at the time was that I was sort of bothered by the level of confidence that critics seemed to have that the argument was wrong or at least among the critics who hadn't really engaged with it. So it's one thing to say, this isn't worth my time to look into, but it's sort of an additional thing to say, this isn't worth my time to look into, but I'm going to like write up an op-ed or a piece saying that it's totally wrong. 
Yeah, I'm actually, really, yeah, I think I was, I've also been really bothered by that as well. You know, this may be like overly harsh, but I do actually think there's something, yeah, sort of irresponsible to, to some extent. If, you know, someone says that they're really concerned about this large scale risk, and often the people raising this concern are quite credible figures like Stuart Russell, who's obviously an extremely prominent AI researcher. And then I think it's okay to just say, well, I'm not really going to look into this. I'm a bit skeptical of it. But if you're going to, you know, go out and try and write stuff and convince people that these arguments are false, they do really think you have some sort of obligation to like, really, really kind of make sure that you're right about this and really make sure that you're accurately representing what the argument is and that you're being fair to the people you're criticizing. Because just, you know, can you imagine thinking you know, for something else of like someone who's convinced that climate change probably isn't a real phenomenon, but they don't read a paper on climate change before they go out and write an op-ed. It just seems like, I don't know, I guess not very sensible. Cool. So I want to transition from those outside view criticisms of the yudkowsky bostrom line of thinking to some of the criticisms or objections that you know, much more closely actually engage with the line of argument. So I know that over time, you've come to have you know, three you know, major objections to the yudkowsky bostrom line. So you want to start talking through some of those in turn? Yeah, so I suppose the, the first objection that I would raise is it seems like a lot of classic presentations of AI risk seem to presume a relatively specific AI development scenario, which I'll call the brain in a box scenario, actually borrowing a term from Elias Rudkowski. And I think the basic idea is that for some period of time, there may be some amount of AI progress, but it won't really transform the world all that much. You'll continue to have maybe some new combination applications like self-driving cars or maybe image recognition systems for diagnosing, you know, diseases and things like that. But you'll basically only have like very narrowly competent AI systems that do very specific things. And in the aggregate, these systems just won't have that large of an impact on the world. They won't really transform the world that much. And then relatively abruptly, maybe over the course of a single day, maybe over the course of something like a month, you'll go from this world where there are only relatively inconsequential AI systems to having one individual AI system that's in some sense very cognitively similar in its abilities to a human. So, you know, about as smart as a person is along most dimensions, not that much better at a given cognitive task, not that much worse at any given cognitive task. You have something that's almost like a human brain, you know, sitting on a computer somewhere. And I think that's often kind of a, almost like an implicitly background to a lot of these presentations of AI risk. And then there are more concrete arguments that are made after that, where there's this argument that once you have this thing that's like a brain in a box, this thing that's in some sense as smart as a person, then you'll get this really interesting jump to, um, you know, a radically super intelligent system. And there are a lot of arguments there, but often it seems to be taken as almost sort of background that the lead up to that point will look like this. Michael, so when you talk about the brain in a box scenario, are you primarily talking about the fact that prior to this intelligence explosion, there aren't, you know, sort of world changing ML systems that have already been deployed? Or are you talking about the arguments that once you get to that point, you end up having this sort of really fast explosion or does brain in the box sort of mean both of those together? So I'm mostly referring to, to the first one. So I'd separate out, you can ask like, you know, will AI progress up to a certain point look like nothing interesting happening? Then pretty suddenly you have this brain in the box style system. And then there's a second question you ask, oh, conditional on us ending up with this brain in the box system, like pretty suddenly will there be a sudden jump to something radically smarter? And I want to separate out that second question, which I do think is discussed pretty extensively. And I want to sort of focus on the first question of like, will progress look like the sudden jump to something that's, that's cognitively like a human without really interesting precedence? Okay, so if that doesn't happen, what do the alternatives actually look like? So I think it's, um, there's a pretty broad range of possibilities. So here's one I might paint is you might think that, you know, there's currently the way AI progress looks like at the moment to some extent is you know, sort of year by year, AI systems, at least in the aggregate, become capable of performing some subset of the tasks that people can, can perform that previously AI systems couldn't. So, you know, there will be a year where um, we have the first AI system that can beat, you know, the best human at chess, or we'll have a year where we have the first AI system that can beat, you know, a typical human at recognizing certain forms of images. And, you know, this thing sort of happens year by year of like, there's this gradual kind of increase in the portion of, you know, relevant tasks that AI systems can perform. And you might also think that at the same time, maybe there'd be a trend in terms of the generality of individual systems. So, you know, this is one thing that people work on in AI research is trying to create individual AI systems, which are able to perform a wider range of tasks as opposed to relying on lots of specialized systems. It seems like generality is, you know, more of a variable than the binary, at least in principle. So you could imagine that, you know, the breadth of tasks that an individual AI system can perform will become wider and wider. And you might think that there are other things that are fairly gradual, like the um, sort of time horizons that systems act on or um, sort of the level of independence that AI systems sort of exhibit might also kind of increase smoothly. 
And so then maybe you end up in a world where, you know, there comes a day where we have the first AI system that can, in principle, do anything a person can do. But at that point, maybe that AI system has already, you know, radically outperforms humans at most tasks. Maybe the first point where we have AI systems that can do all the stuff that people can do, like, they've already been able to do most things better than people can before that point. Maybe this first system that can do all the stuff that an individual person can do also, you know, exists in the world with a bunch of other extremely competent systems with different levels of generality and different levels of competence in different areas. And maybe it's also been preceded by lots of, you know, extremely transformative systems that in, you know, lots of different ways are, are super intelligent. Okay, so that's one potential scenario that looks different from the brain in the box scenario. Are there others you want to talk about? Yeah, so I might maybe label the one I just described, let's call it like the smooth expansion scenario, where you just have this gradual increase in both, you know, the things AI systems can do, but also a gradual increase in the generality of individual AI systems. But you might also imagine that maybe we don't even really see like that much of an increase in how general a typical AI system is. Maybe we don't even really end up with very general systems that play that larger role in, you know, whatever it is that AI systems are doing. So I have a colleague at FHI, Eric Drexler, who has this really good paper called Reframing Superintelligence that, at least as I understand it, argues that people maybe are inclined to overestimate the role that very general systems might play in the future of AI. And the basic argument is that, so first of all, today, we mostly have AI systems that aren't that general. We mostly have pretty specialized systems. And so maybe you just have some sort of you know, prior that, given that this is what AI systems look like today, maybe this will also be true in the future. In the future, we'll have like, you know, way more systems that can do way more stuff in aggregate, and maybe they'll still be relatively narrow. Another argument for it is that it seems like specialized systems often outperform general ones, or it's often easier to make, let's say, two specialized systems, one which performs task A and one which performs task B pretty well, rather than a single system that does both well. And it seems like this is often the case to some extent in AI research today. Like it's, it's easier to create individual systems that can play a single Atari game quite well than it is to create one system that plays all Atari games quite well. And it also seems like it's kind of a general, maybe economic or biological principle or something like that. And lots of different cases, there are benefits from specialization as you get sort of like more systems are interacting. So, um, you know, biologically, when you have a larger organism, cells tend to become more specialized. Or economically, as you have a more sophisticated or complex economy that does more stuff, it tends to be the case that you have greater specialization in terms of worker skills. So, you know, post-industrial revolution, there's a really substantial increase in terms of how specific the tasks that one person versus another perform. Or if you have, you know, an assembly line, there's benefits to having people who just do like one specific bit of it rather than doing all of it. Or like an international level, there's an increase in terms of you know, benefits like one country having certain specialization versus another. So maybe there's something you can sort of argue from this general principle that if we're imagining, you know, future economic production being really driven by these AI systems that could have different levels of generality, maybe the optimal level of generality actually isn't that high. And I guess it's sort of like a last argument that at least as I understand it, sort of Eric puts forward that insofar as you actually buy some of these, you know, safety concerns that people have or these classic arguments, they often seem to focus on these very general systems causing havoc. So if you have, you know, any ability to choose, maybe if you're safety conscious, you sort of will have incentives to push things towards more narrow systems. So, you know, I'm not obviously very clear, like, what's more likely, but I think this is also another possibility, is maybe we don't even really end up with very general systems that play, like, a really large role. Cool. So just making sure I've followed the two alternatives to brain in the box that you laid out. One of them, which you sort of labeled as gradual emergence, is there are, over time, sort of more and more general, more and more capable systems, and we eventually get to human-level AGI, and that ends up being important, or there are AGI-like systems that are important, but it's not like a huge jump from what existed before. And the second scenario, which is the one that Drexler lays out, is one where you know general systems don't end up being that important, you know, even later on, because uh, specialized systems end up being like more relevant and more powerful. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I think you could also, like, it's also plausible, we'll just have some really weird thing that's hard to characterize. We have, you know, lots of systems of different levels of generality and agency and, you know, all this stuff. And it's gradual in some way, but it's just very hard to describe, which seems like maybe even most likely me. <laughs> cool. Got it. So I guess maybe going back to the first alternative that you talked about, the gradual emergence alternative, can you give some sense of, you know, at the point that human-level AGI is developed, what are some examples of like these contenders, like possibilities for the types of advanced AI systems that might already exist at that point and, you know, how the world might be different? Yeah, I, I think it's probably, I think it's probably pretty difficult to paint any really specific picture. So I think there's some high-level things you could say about it. So one high-level thing you might say about it is that, you know, take a list of economically relevant tasks that people perform today, like take Bureau of Labor Statistics, like database, and then, you know, 
just kind of cross off a bunch and assume that AI systems can do them, or they can either do certain things that make those tasks not very economically relevant. We can also, you know, think that there's some stuff that people just can't do today. That's just not really on people's radar as like a economically or politically or militarily relevant task that maybe AI systems will be able to perform. So one present day example of something that people can't do that AI systems can do is generating convincing fake images or convincing fake videos, these things called deepfakes. That's not really something the human brain is capable of doing on its own. AI systems can. So it's like very kind of general abstract level. You imagine lots of stuff that's done today by humans is either done by AI systems or made irrelevant by AI systems. And then, you know, lots of capabilities that yeah, we just wouldn't even necessarily consider it might also exist as well. It's so probably like lots of individual domains. As you maybe imagine, you know, research looks very different. Maybe like really large portions of scientific research are automated or maybe just the processes or just in some way AI driven in a way that they're not today. Maybe political decision making is much more heavily informed by outputs of AI systems than it is today. Or maybe certain aspects of things like law enforcement or like arbitration or things like this are to some extent automated. And just the world could be just quite different in lots of different ways. So I guess self-driving cars seems like you know, like transportation is a decent sized part of the economy. So like self-driving cars feels like it's, you know, taking one real slice of things that humans can do and sort of automating that away. So should I just think of self-driving cars, but across many other industries and activities all sort of exist? I mean, I think to some extent that's reasonable, but I think it probably would give a sort of distorted picture. So like one analogy is, you know, if you think about, let's say, automation in the context of agriculture. So if you look at the set of stuff that people were doing 200 years ago, a huge amount of human labor was tied up in just like, you know, working fields and things like that. And it probably would have been wrong if you're trying to think about what's the, the significance of industrial automation to just imagine, oh, okay, it's like the economy is the same. It's just instead of like people, you know, plowing fields, there's like tractors, you know, so a couple of things happen. So one thing that happens is as you automate certain tasks, new tasks emerge and become relevant for people. Another thing that happens is like lots of the applications of technologies aren't really well thought of as just replacing people in roles that currently exist. They often introduce these new capabilities, like, you know, industrialization is like super relevant for like railroads and tanks and lots of crazy stuff. Or computers, if you think about the significance of computers in general, the existence of things like social media websites and stuff like this, it's not really just kind of replacing a thing that was already happening. And I mean, I think just basically you should have this prior that's like very, very difficult to actually have a concrete image. You should maybe imagine in this sort of scenario that loads of stuff that's done by people today is no longer done by people, but there's lots of crazy stuff that's being done by people that no one's doing today. And there's also lots of crazy capabilities that just there's no close analog to in terms of the technology we have today. Okay, cool. And then if I'm someone who you know, like buys the sort of story that you're going to have an intelligence explosion once you reach some point that might be human level AGI ish. And I sort of hear the description that you just gave, you know, like one thing that you threw out there was AI playing a really big role in science. Why don't I just think that at the point that we have that level of technology, we sort of like will necessarily already have human level AGI. I mean, assume that among the things that these narrow AIs are really good at doing, one of them is programming AI. And so you sort of end up with that sort of leap from getting one of those technologies quickly to human level AGI and then sort of like take off from there. So I I think the basic reaction after this is if you think of, let's say, applied science, there's really a lot of different tasks that feed into making progress in engineering or, you know, areas of applied science. Like there's not really just this one task of like do science. Like let's take, yeah, I mean, like let's say take, for example, the, you know, production of computing hardware. I obviously do not have like at all a clean picture of this, but I assume that there's a huge amount of different works in terms of how you're designing these factories or building them, how you're making decisions about the design of the chips. Lots of, you know, things about like where you're getting your resources from, actually physically building the factories. I assume if you take the staff of Intel that's relevant to the production of new chips or the staff of like NVIDIA, and then you do some sort of, you know, labeling of what are the cognitive tasks that people need to perform, you're probably going to come up with a pretty long and pretty diverse list of things. And then, you know, you could obviously react like, all right, I, for that reason, I have the view that I think there's going to be some sudden jump that allows AI systems to like, you know, sort of discontinuously perform a way larger number of tasks than they could in the previous year. But I suppose if you're imagining, you know, this kind of more gradual scenario where like this trend continues of like some sub tasks unlocked each year, then intuitively, I think you'd sort of think, okay, maybe over time, a larger portion of the work that goes into producing progress in, in applied science or engineering, a larger portion of these tasks are automated, but there's no, you know, year where just we've switched from, okay, we don't have automated science. Like, oh, okay, we do have automated science. Okay. So let's assume that the first alternative that you described ends up playing out. I forget if you called it smooth expansion or gradual emergence, but it's the one where we end up with 
systems that are both general and super intelligent. But you know, there's a whole bunch of other really important transformations that are due to AI that lead up to it. What does that mean for the overall AI risk argument? Right. So I think if things are gradual in this way, you know, if we have lots of systems of kind of like intermediate generality and, and incompetence, and, you know, the world sort of doesn't just radically transform over a short period of time, but things move in some sense gradually. But I think this has a few implications relative to what you'd expect if the brain in the box scenario sort of came true. I think one of the first implications is that people are less likely to be, to be caught off guard by anything that happens. So, you know, if you have this sort of brain-in-the-box model of AI development, then we really don't know when this could happen. You know, maybe someone has some crazy math breakthrough tomorrow and we just end up with, you know, AGI, you know, some individual system that's, you know, human level or like human-like in its intellect. And that just seems very hard to predict in the same way that, for example, it's hard to predict when someone will find a new proof, like a mathematical theorem. Whereas if stuff is very piecemeal, then it seems like you can sort of extrapolate from trends. So, for example... Progress in making computers faster is something that's not extremely you know, unpredictable. It's sufficiently gradual. You can sort of extrapolate and you can sort of know, oh, okay, I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and find that computers are 10,000 times faster or that you know, solar panels are 10,000 times more efficient or that the economy is X times larger. So that's one significant thing is people are more likely to, to sort of not be caught off guard, which is quite useful, I think. Why is it important for people not to be caught off guard? What's going to happen in this time where we realize, oh, shit, this might be coming? That makes it like a, that like really makes a change to the story. I mean, so one implication is that people are more likely to do useful work ahead of time or more likely to have institutions in place ahead of time to deal with, you know, stuff that will arise. This definitely doesn't completely resolve the issue. There are some issues that people, you know, know will happen ahead of time and they're not really sufficiently handling. So climate change is a prominent example. But even in the case of climate change, I think we're much better off knowing, oh, okay, the climate's going to be changing this much over, you know, this period of time, as opposed to just sort of, you know, waking up one day and it's like, oh man, the climate's just, you know, really, really different. Definitely, the issue is not in any way resolved by this, but it is quite hopeful that people sort of see what's coming when the changes are relatively gradual. Like institutions, you know, to some extent are being put in place. Yeah, as well, I think there's also some other things that you sort of get out of imagining this more gradual scenario as opposed to the, the sort of brain-in-the-box scenario. So then one which is, I think, also quite connected is people are more likely to also notice specific safety issues as they arise. So like insofar as there are any, you know, unresolved issues about making AI systems behave the way you want them to do, or let's say not unintentionally or sort of in some sense deceiving the people who are designing them, you're likely to probably see low-level versions of these before you see very extreme versions of these. So you have, you know, relatively competent or relatively, you know, important AI systems mess up in ways that aren't, let's say, world-destroying before you have, you even get to the position where you have AI systems whose behavior is that consequential. You know, if you imagine that you have, live in a world where you have Lots and lots of really advanced AI systems deployed throughout, you know, all the different sectors of the economy and, you know, throughout political systems. Insofar as there are these really fundamental safety issues, you should probably have noticed them by that point. Like there will have probably been, you know, smaller failures. So people should also be less caught off guard or less sort of blindly oblivious to certain issues that might arise with the design of really advanced systems. So one counter argument that I hear sometimes boils down to you won't get any of these types of warnings because we should expect that if this is going to end up being like a truly super intelligent AI, it's going to realize that it should not give any warnings. And so you actually won't start seeing any of the lying manipulation until it's at a point where that's actually beneficial for the AI. What do you think of that response to that concern? So I think this is also something that's to some extent resolved by stuff being gradual and deploying lots of you know, AI systems throughout the world well before that point. So insofar as the methods we're using in some sense incline ML systems to sort of hide certain traits that they have or engage in deception, we should also know this sort of less damaging forms of deception or like less competent forms of deception, probably well before that point. If we have like loads and loads of ML systems out in the world, we already actually have some relatively low-key versions of this. I think there's a case where... Um, Someone was training, I think, a robotic gripper in simulation, and it learned that it could sort of, let's say, I think it was place itself between the sort of virtual camera and the sort of digital object in such a way that it looked like it was, I think, manipulating it or touching it and, like, you know, accomplishing some task. But in fact, it just sort of, you know, done a thing where people make it seem like they're leaning against the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <laughs> and so we do have, you know, some examples of low-level forms of deception. And I think if stuff is sufficiently gradual, we'll probably continue to notice those. If they start to become really serious, we'll start to notice that they're becoming really serious, and we shouldn't be just totally caught off guard by this, the fact that this is a capability that AI systems have. And then is the argument that the solutions that we find to handle deception on narrower or less powerful systems will then at least sometimes be scalable to more advanced systems? Or is it more just like we got a warning notice that this is something that AI sometimes does, so we're not going to 
end up employing advanced systems in the wild until we figure out under what circumstances do these systems end up being in transparent. So I think it's a little bit of both. So definitely one aspect is just people are less likely to be caught off guard by the idea that something might be safe or like less likely to deploy something being completely oblivious to it potentially having damaging properties. But the only one like you were suggesting is that we might have lots of opportunities for sort of trial and error learning, like, you know, using techniques and relatively simple or crude systems, sort of figuring out what works there. Then we have, you know, systems that operate in different domains, so they're in some sense more sophisticated, and we sort of maybe realize that some of the techniques don't perfectly scale, we adjust them and deal with that situation. I think generally speaking, if stuff is sufficiently continuous up until the point where we have, you know, systems that can do all the stuff that people can do, then I would be surprised if the techniques were completely unscalable. Maybe you transition from one technique to another, but if, you know, things are continuous with regard to capabilities, I'd be sort of surprised if, you know, safety considerations are, in some sense, don't at all carry forward in a relatively smooth way. Okay, so we were going through some of the implications of this brain-in-a-box scenario and had talked about trial and error not being caught off guard. I think you had something to say about AI tools. Yeah, so I think this is just one more way in which I think things being fairly gradual could be helpful. And this is another one that I think, for example, Eric Drexler has raised is that if we're imagining that progress is unfolding in this gradual way, then it's also probably the case that lots of the intermediate systems we develop along the way could be quite useful for designing other AI systems or keeping, you know, making sure that other AI systems are safe or sort of don't get out of hand. And so we should also be probably imagining when we think about the future, our ability to sort of avoid accidents and stuff like that. We shouldn't just imagine, you know, our current level of ability to sort of keep watch on things or sort of probe systems. We should imagine ourselves having probably various AI-enabled capabilities that we don't have today that could be quite helpful. Is there something you could learn that like really increase your credence in the possibility that you're going to see some of these huge jumps in discontinuities? There's this intuition I think some people have from evolutionary history, where it seems like there's some sense in which the evolution of human intelligence seemed to have had some sort of interesting discontinuity in it, where like on aggregate chimpanzees and the common ancestors of humans basically can't do a lot of interesting stuff in the world. They can make like extremely rudimentary tools and that's basically it. Whereas in aggregate, you know, humans can do a bunch of crazy stuff in the world together, like go to the moon. It seems like there actually aren't that many generations separating this extremely accomplished species from this extremely unaccomplished species. There's not that many genetic mutations that are probably involved. And if you sort of map that onto AI development, if you imagine sort of, let's say, compressing the evolution of human intelligence into 100 years and sort of retracing it in some sense in the context of AI development, then maybe it's like nothing that interesting happening for like the first 100 years. And then in the last year, maybe even the last month or something, suddenly you have, you know, things that can go to the moon. I think that's sort of the rough intuition that leads some people to think that you could actually have something that looks quite discontinuous, at least on like normal human time scales. I think the thing that I'd be most interested in is basically, I'd be really interested in an argument that tries to look at what happened in the evolution of human intelligence, the extent that we can, we actually have any sense of what happened there and tries to sort of like map it on to the way AI development is going and tries to see if there's any sort of analogy you can draw, like where you can sort of strengthen the analogy that should give us more reason to think. That thing that sort of happened in, you know, human evolutionary history that looked quite discontinuous on evolutionary timescales, something very analogous to that might happen in the development of AI systems that will look quite discontinuous on like human timescales. I think that would probably be the main sort of intellectual track to go down that could lead me to assign a higher probability to sort of a, a sudden jump to much more advanced systems. So the other thing that I hear a bit, and I don't even know if this is going to end up conceptually holding together, but often the sort of point that's focused on as being the point where there would be a jump is something around human level AGI defined as something like an AGI that can do basically all tasks as well as humans can and therefore super intelligent in some tasks. And I guess it's possible the more natural point to like expect a jump would be something like at the point where some particular AI system has more optimization power or however you want to sort of like define it than all of the other AI that's out there. And I can imagine that that would be the point in which you'd start seeing like really big feedback loops. So I think the issue here is that if we're imagining a world where there's one single, you know, AI system whose ability to contribute to sort of, you know, AI progress outweighs and aggregate all the other AI systems that exist in the world, then it seems to imply that some really interesting jump has already happened. And so I, I think I, I do agree, like, if we conditional on us ending up in that scenario, it does seem like there's something to be said for like, oh, man, we have this one single AI system that's way out ahead of everything else. And if they already do contribute a massive amount to AI research, you know, maybe its lead even just gets amplified. But I guess it, it seems like you still need to think there'll be some sort of discontinuity to sort of e even end up in that world in the first place. Cool. That makes sense. Okay, so we've talked through a few of the implications that come out of this question of whether or not there are these big discontinuities in AI development. And the world looks a bit different if people are caught off guard versus they have time to prepare. It looks different depending on 
are there other AI systems, AI tools around already to help with the development? And so those are sort of like the stakes. Now the question is, how likely is it that we will be in the world foreseen or like described by the classic arguments where you had these big discontinuities versus a world where things are going more gradually? Yeah, I think I, I don't have, I think an extremely robust view on this. I would put it below, let's say, as a somewhat made up number, you know, I'd put it below 10% that we end up with a really, something that looks like a really large jump that's sort of evocative of the sort of thing that's imagined in these classic arguments. And just for context, it, yeah. how large exactly are we talking about there? Yeah, so I think this is, this is also something that's quite difficult to, I think it's sort of a sufficiently vague thing. It's, it's sort of difficult to sort of put numbers on it. I know that, for example, Paul Cristiano has sometimes tried to use the economic growth rate as sort of a proxy. Well, obviously, this isn't, doesn't exactly capture what we care about, but there's some sort of intuition that sort of like the more, in some sense, useful or advanced, you know, the AI systems we have are, the more that if they're sort of directed appropriately, they could sort of increase GDP. And so you can imagine, you know, maybe if we end up in the brain in the box scenario, probably like GDP is not going to contain the same, like, oh, it's like 3% growth thing. I think this is one, you know, one way you can sort of operationalize it, where I think, for example, Paul Cristiano has said that, you know, his view is it's really unlikely that we'll suddenly jump to like a year where there's a, a 50% or above economic growth rate for like a single year as one way of saying, oh, there probably won't be this extremely extreme thing. Obviously, even a jump to 25% or something like that is historically unprecedented discontinuity. But I think that's one way of operationalizing it. So I might maybe implicitly be using something like that when I'm talking about discontinuity. All right, so are we saying something like two years later, people are in a world that they like fundamentally recognize but has also changed more than they've ever seen the world change over two years before? I think that is probably fairly reasonable. There's also this sort of, this is, this is maybe a bit in the weeds, there's also this distinction you can draw between any given point in time, is the world in some sense changing much faster? And then this sort of second order question of how quickly did the change, you know, pace of change itself change? So just, you know, with an analogy of economic history, the economy changes way faster today than it did hundreds of years ago. Technology changes way faster but the change in the rate itself was relatively smooth. It was, you know, happened over hundreds of years. And so I'd maybe, I'd maybe be more inclined to focus on this sort of second order, like change in the rate of change. Even if the pace of change goes faster, do I think that that process will itself be fairly smooth and people can sort of adapt to things moving faster? Okay, so you're giving sort of your, your, just the distribution of your beliefs over these scenarios. Right. And I think that there is, I think, so I think there's some case for just stuff eventually becoming much faster. And some of the arguments here have to do with economic growth models, and economic growth is really, really poorly understood. But at least if you take certain models sort of at face value, one argument that people make is there's sort of this relationship between, say, capital and labor and economic growth, where you combine basically technology and like stuff with human workers, and you get out sort of outputs. And research is the same way, where you combine researchers with the tools they have, and you get out sort of intellectual progress. And one issue that sort of keeps the pace of things relatively slow is that you have, in any given year, like a relatively fixed number of you know, researchers, just human population growth is sort of, to some extent, exogenous. And so even if you have technological progress, you sort of can't feed it back directly into technological progress, that there's sort of this, in some sense, human labor bottleneck. There's a number of papers by actually prominent growth economists that sort of look at this idea and say, oh, if you eventually get to the point where just humans no, really, no longer really play a prominent role in economic growth or in scientific research, maybe you have like a much, in some sense, tighter feedback loop where technological progress or economic output just sort of feeds back directly into itself. And maybe in some sense, things move quite a bit faster. I would say vaguely, I don't know enough about the area, but I would give it at least, you know, one in, one in three chance that at some point, if we're imagining the long run, stuff becomes pretty radically faster in the same way that stuff is radically faster today than it was a few hundred years ago, although it's very non-robust. And then again, quite vague, there's a question of let's condition on stuff in some sense becoming faster. You know, how smooth is that transition to a world where things are faster? Is it sort of the transition that happens over the course of what feels like or could be considered, let's say, you know, two years or less or something? And I would probably give it, again, I don't really know where these numbers are coming from. I'd give it below 5%. So you've pushed back a little bit on this model that the classic arguments seem to use that sort of has brain-in-a-box type of model of AI development that basically the main characteristic is the discontinuities over the course of development. And we talked about some of the implications of ways in which you might be a bit less worried whether or not to be these discontinuities. Are there people who disagree with you and who, you know, really would want to push back on you and say there's a good reason to think that there are going to be big discontinuities over time? Yeah, so I think there are certainly people who would disagree with me. 
So one example would just be, I think that a number of different people working on AI safety, like I think especially probably researchers at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, probably have a pretty different model, something that's, you know, a lot more sort of jumpy in terms of what progress will look like. There's also a lot of researchers who are obviously working towards eventually developing AGI and are often relatively optimistic about the timelines for doing this, which implies, you know, some degree of discontinuity. So if we get there, let's say in the next 10 years, and that implies... You know, something pretty jumpy has happened if 10 years from now we're in a world where human labor is, let's say, irrelevant. So certainly there are a lot of people who disagree. Do you have a sense of why they disagree? Yeah, I think there's there's actually a lot of heterogeneity here. I think one thing that's unfortunate is really not that much has been written up arguing for something like a brain in a box scenario. So there is a bit of this in, um, for example, a series of back and forth blog posts between Elie Zudkowski and Robin Hansen in 2008 called The Film Debate. They're like little bits of a few paragraphs and a few different sort of white papers here and there, but really not that much. So for example, if I remember correctly, I don't think that there is anything, for example, in the book Superintelligence that directly addresses the relative plausibility of something like the brain in a box scenario versus, you know, something like the smooth expansion scenario or sort of presents an argument for why you'd expect something like the brain in a box scenario. So my impression of, I guess, have the arguments for this position are a lot more through conversation and informal bits and pieces have gotten here or there. I think there are probably a few main reasons. The one, again, is the sort of evolutionary analogy. Like, I think a lot of people do find it sort of compelling that there was, you know, something like a discontinuity in the evolution of human cognition and think that maybe the suggests will be something that looks like a discontinuity on human time scales when it comes to AI capabilities I think some people, especially in the past, have this intuition that maybe there is sort of like one sort of intellectual breakthrough that if only we had this relatively simple intellectual breakthrough, we could just sort of suddenly jump from AI systems that can't do much of interest to um, AI systems that can do all the stuff that people can do. This is, I think, for example, the position that Minkowski argues in, in the film debate. And I think I don't entirely understand the reasoning for it. And it seems like to some extent, there's a little bit of counter evidence from it seems like AI progress is to a large extent driven by lots of piecemeal improvements by computing power gradually getting better and stuff like that. And it seems like that's often the case for other technologies. That's pretty piecemeal. But a lot of people do seem to have the, the intuition that maybe there's something that looks like a single intellectual insight that if we could have, it would allow us to jump forward. I think there's also almost the opposite sort of line of argument where I think some people have the intuition that in some sense, AI progress is mostly about having enough computing power to do interesting things. Maybe the more intellectual stuff or maybe the more sort of algorithmic improvement stuff doesn't really matter that much, or maybe it's almost sort of downstream of computing power improvements. And I think people who um, have this view, I think there's a few different ways it can go. I think one intuition that some people have is if in some sense computing power is the main thing that drives AI progress, then at some point there'll be some level of computing power, you know, such that when we have that level of computing power, we'll just have, you know, AI systems that can at least in aggregate do all the stuff that people can do. And if you're trying to estimate when that point will be, Maybe one thing you should do is kind of make some sort of estimate of how much computing power the human brain uses. And then, you know, notice the fact that the amount of computing power we use to train ML systems isn't that different and sort of think, well, maybe if we have, you know, an amount of computing power that's not much larger than what we have now, maybe that will be sufficient to train AI systems, do all the stuff that people can do. And then you can sort of almost backwards extrapolate where it's sort of like, there will be some amount of computing power that will allow us to have really radically transformative systems. That amount of computing power is going to be reached relatively soon in the future. So therefore, I guess through backwards extrapolation, it must be the case that progress is relatively discontinuous. And I think there's kind of a few maybe wonky steps in there that I don't really understand. But I do think something like the argument is compelling to, to a subset of people. So I suppose just more generally, if you have some sort of reason for thinking that we'll have AI systems that can do the stuff that people can do, not that far in the future, maybe you know, five or 10 or 15 years, then if you hold that view and think that there are arguments for it, then that seems to imply that there's got to be some level of sort of discontinuity. And the sooner you think it might happen, the greater the discontinuity like necessarily will be. But so it sounds like there are people taking up the opposing side. Why haven't they made you change your mind? So I think there's, there's sort of a couple of reasons. So one reason is I think I just, I haven't really encountered, I think any of very thorough versions of these arguments yet. It's just the case for the most part that they haven't yet been at least publicly written up in a lot of detail. So for example, like I'm not aware of any, you know, say more than a page long piece of writing that uses the evolutionary analogy to try and argue for this discontinuity or sort of like really looks into literature in terms of what happened with humans. And so that's just, just sort of one thing is I guess I haven't really maybe sort of encountered sufficiently fleshed out versions of them. And I guess to some extent the absence of that, I'm more inclined to fall back on just impressions of like what progress has looked like so far, and this sort of general, really recurring phenomenon that technological progress tends to be pretty continuous, and sort of give more weight to that and sort of view that as more robust than these somewhat more specific arguments I haven't really seen in detail. So it sounds like a lot of the 
arguments in this space haven't been written up. Seems to me like some of yours have. Have people who disagreed with you read any of your writing on discontinuities, and have you gotten direct pushback on that? Yeah, I, I really, I basically haven't gotten that much pushback. I haven't really maybe gotten that many comments in general yet. I think one bit of pushback is, for example, that I may be sort of unfairly devaluing arguments on the basis of them not having been sort of sufficiently written up, that maybe I should still give more weight to them than I'm giving them, and that maybe it should be more of a state of like giving them a lot of weight and then sort of until proven otherwise, as opposed to, I suppose, what I'm doing where I'm not giving them that much weight until I feel like I've sort of really gotten them in detail. I think that's one piece of pushback I've gotten. Although I think in general, I haven't received sort of that many counter arguments. I think I've also circulated the stuff or had it read by many fewer people than, for example, Robin Hansen or Paul Cristiano have, who have written relatively similar connected things, sort of pushing back against the view that things will be pretty discontinuous. And then at least going by things like, you know, comments on their, their blog posts, I don't think I've seen any very sort of detailed rebuttals. Yeah, so one concern people often raise when they are looking at the classic AI arguments is that they just can't understand why a super intelligent AI would do something as stupid as, you know, whatever the thought experiment is, turn all the humans into paperclips. Anything smart enough to do that should know that it shouldn't do that. So uh, to what extent does this just sort of shut down the argument and just prove that like, we really don't have to be worried? Yeah, so actually, I, I definitely actually disagree with that objection. I think this is definitely something you see pretty often. Sometimes, let's say, kind of like op-ed pieces, like marketing's concerns is like, you know, oh, if the thing is so smart, it should know that you didn't want it to, you know, make paper pips. Or like, if it's so smart, it should know the right thing to do. And I think the, the sort of common response to this is what's sometimes called the orthogonality thesis, where, you know, two things being orthogonal just means that they're basically completely independent the idea here is that basically any given goal can be pursued extremely effectively or intelligently, or almost any given goal can. That is at least in principle possible to create an AI system that extremely effectively, you know, tries to just maximize the number of paper clips or tries to, you know, stack chairs as tall as it, as it wants, or just do any given bizarre thing. That at least it's in principle possible to like design a system that has some really weird goal that a human would never have and that pursues it very effectively. And essentially what the ortho orthogonality thesis does is it says, we shouldn't think that just because something is in some intuitive sense smart, that will be trying to do something that any human would ever want to do. It could be in some sense intuitively smart, but doing something that's just quite bizarre and quite at odds with what humans prefer. I do actually, though, have, I suppose, another objection, which is sort of in the vicinity of the orthogonal thesis. And I think something that sometimes people have in mind when they talk about the orthogonality of intelligence and goals is they sort of have this picture of AI development where we're creating systems that are in some sense smarter and smarter, and then there's a separate project of trying to figure out what goals to give these AI systems. And sort of the way that this works, and I think some of the classic presentations of risk, is that there's sort of this deadline picture, that there will come a day where we have extremely intelligent systems. And if we can't by that day figure out how to give them the right goals, then we might give them the wrong goals and disaster might occur. And so we have this sort of exogenous deadline of the creep of AI capability progress. And then we need to sort of solve this issue before that day arises. And that's something that I think I, I, for the most part, disagree with. And why do you disagree with that? Yeah, so I think if you look at the way AI development, development works and you look at the way that sort of other technologies have been developed, it seems like the act of, in some sense, making something more capable and the, the act or project of making it sort of have the right kinds of goals often seem really deeply intertwined. So just to kind of make this concrete, let's say what it means for something to be pursuing a goal is that it's engaging in some behavior that's sort of usefully, from a common sense perspective, explained in terms of it trying to, to accomplish some task. So if we take a really simple case of, let's say, a thermostat, it's sometimes kind of useful to think of it as trying to keep the temperature steady as that, that is sort of the goal of this piece of technology. Or something that plays chess, it's sometimes kind of useful to think of it as sort of trying to win at chess. It's sometimes a useful frame of mind to, to have when trying to explain its behavior. And it seems like, at least on this perspective, often there's not sort of a separate project of giving something the right goals and making it more capable. So just to walk through a few examples, the thermostat, you know, when you make a thermostat, there's this thing where you make a metal strip that like expands in a certain way and cuts off current if it's sort of at a certain temperature. And the act of doing that makes the thermostat both like behave in a way that acts like it's trying to keep the temperature steady, but also makes it sort of capable of achieving that. When people are programming, you know, old chess engines like Deep Blue, they put in a bunch of rules for like what it should do in certain circumstances or what sorts of search procedures it should do. The act of doing that both made it act as though it was trying to win at chess and made it capable of playing chess. When people are designing reinforcement learning systems, they start out just behaving basically sort of randomly. This is the way that it often works. Machine learning is something that has a policy that just basically engages really poorly. If you look at it, it's really not useful to think of it as pursuing any sorts of goals. And then there's this feedback process. We sort of give it feedback on the basis of the actions it's performed. And over time, goals essentially start to take shape in it. It starts to sort of act as though it's trying to do something that like is compatible with the reward you're giving it. and also starts to be more competent at it. 
And often it's sort of this interesting intertwined process where you sort of shift sort of what the thing's instrumental goal should be in the process of trying to make it more competent. I think a last example along these lines is if you look at human evolutionary history, there's not really the sort of capability goal, you know, genes and like intelligence genes. It's all sort of mixed together. There's things that you can do that affect the thing's behavior. And some of the things you do to affect this behavior can be seen as making it smarter or making it more like it's trying to pursue a certain goal, but there's not really a, a very clean separation. Okay, so you've given a few examples of systems where the goals of the system and the capability of the system seem sort of necessarily connected. And then you also made a claim about how that might affect AI development going forward. Can you talk a little bit more about that second bit? Like, what does that actually mean for how AI is going to be developed? Yeah, so I think it's sort of useful to maybe illustrate this with a concrete concrete case. So let's talk about, I guess, a problem that is sometimes raised as a, a useful sort of thought experiment in the AI safety literature. Let's say you're trying to develop a, let's say, robotic system that can clean a house as well as a human house cleaner can, or at least develop something in simulation that can do this. And basically, you'll find that if you try to do this today, it's really hard to do that. So a lot of sort of traditional techniques that people use to train these sorts of systems involve reinforcement learning with essentially like a, a hand-specified reward function. And so what that means is, let's say you have a simulation of a robot cleaning a house. You write down some line of code that specifies a specific condition under which you sort of give the, the simulated robot positive feedback. And then the robot will sort of over time act more and more in a way that sort of is consistent with the feedback you're giving it. And one issue here is it's actually pretty nuanced what you want the robot to be doing. So let's say you write down like a really simple condition for like giving the robot feedback. You just sort of say, oh, one thing I care about in the context of cleaning a house is I, I prefer for, you know, dust to be sort of eliminated. Like I don't want my house to be dusty. And you write down the reward function. It just sort of says, uh, the less dust is in a house, the better the feedback I give the robot. I sort of automate this process. I run the simulation a bunch of times and I sort of get out a robot that's acting in accordance with this feedback. And one issue you'll find is that the robot is probably doing like totally horrible things because you care about a lot of other stuff besides just minimizing dust. So if you just do this, the robot won't care about, let's say, throwing out valuable objects that happen to be dusty. It won't care about, let's say, like ripping apart like a, let's say, a couch cushion to find dust on the inside. There's a bunch of stuff you probably care about, like straightening the objects in your house or just making things, sure things are neat. Trash is thrown out, other stuff isn't thrown out that just sort of won't be handled if you just make this sort of dust minimization function. And then you can try and make it a bit more complicated, like, oh, I care about dust, but I also care about, let's say, the right objects being thrown out and the wrong objects not being thrown out. But you'll find it really, really hard to actually write down some line of code that captures all the nuances of what counts as, like, you know, valuable object to throw out and valuable object not to throw out. And you'll probably find any simple line of code you write isn't going to capture all the nuances. Probably the system will end up doing, you know, stuff you're not happy with. And this is basically essentially like an alignment problem. This is a problem of sort of giving the system the right goals. You don't really have a way using the standard techniques of making the system even really act like it's trying to do the thing that you want it to be doing. And there are some techniques that are being worked on actually by people in the AI safety and AI alignment community to try and basically figure out a way of getting the system to do what you want it to be doing without needing to sort of hand specify this reward function. So there's techniques where, for example, you give it feedback by hand and then the system tries to figure out the patterns by which you're giving it feedback and it sort of learns how to automate the process of giving feedback itself. There's techniques where, for example, you watch a human clean a house and you're trying to figure out what they care about. And on that basis, you try to automate the process of sort of giving feedback to a learning system. And these are all things that are being developed by basically the AI safety community. And I think the sort of interesting thing about them is that it seems like until we actually develop these techniques, probably we're not in a position to develop anything that even really looks like it's trying to clean a house or anything that anyone would ever really want to deploy in the real world. It seems like there's this interesting sense in which we have this sort of system we'd like to create, but until we can work out the sorts of techniques that people in the alignment community are working on, we can't give it anything even approaching the right goals. And if we can't give it anything approaching the right goals, probably we just, you know, aren't going to go out and, let's say, deploy systems in the world that just mess up people's houses in order to minimize dust. So I think there's this interesting sense in which processes to give things the right goals sort of bottleneck the process of, of creating systems that we would regard as highly capable and that we want to sort of put out there. So just to sort of, I guess, contrast the, the picture I've just painted with some of the ways that, in which these issues are talked about in sort of kind of the classic AI risk arguments is there's at least a framing that at least Eliezer Yudkowsky, for example, has used relatively frequently. And it's this framing of, you know, how do we get an extremely you know, super intelligent system to move a strawberry to a plate without blowing up the world? And I think that this is basically a framing that just doesn't, doesn't really seem to connect to the way that machine learning research works. It's not like for the house cleaning case, we'll create a system that's in some sense super intelligent, and then we just sort of figure out, okay, like, how do we make it clean houses? It's really this pretty intertwined thing. It's not like you have this thing that's in some sense super intelligent, and then you sort of kind of need to slot in some behavior. It's all sort of tangled up. So I guess how much of the work here is being done by the narrowness of the cleaning bot? 
Like, if you want to design a bot that's going to, like, clean a house, then you're going to heavily focus on evaluating it based on how good it's doing at house cleaning. If there are ways in which it's, like, a little bit misaligned with house cleaning, then, like, that's a major problem. And so you're going to, like, fix that. If you wanted to have a substantially more general robot, will it still be the case that you'll have as strong a process that will move you towards alignment as you develop? Yeah, so I don't think it's really a big difference. So it seems like, you know, generality is more of a, a continuum than a binary variable. You know, something is more general, the more sort of tasks it can perform or the wider range of tasks it can perform or the, you know, more environments it can perform them in. And so you might imagine, for example, that let's take the house clean robot case and sort of turn up the generality knob. Like, let's make it say it's not just the house clean robot. It's also a robot where, you know, it can take certain verbal instructions and like go out to the, the store to buy things. Or we can throw stuff on top of it. Oh, it also has certain personal assistant functionality, like in the process of cleaning the house, it also, you know, it checks your email and, you know, puts things on your calendar. Or we can kind of keep, you know, throwing things into the basket. Like it's also a thing that if you give it certain verbal commands, it helps you plan military invasions and things like that. I guess it's not really clear to me why the process of just sort of making a thing's behavior more flexible or making it able to engage in a wider range of behaviors sort of cleaves apart the sort of deep entanglement between the process of sort of giving it goals and the process of making it capable. Huh. So, okay, so if we take a case where, yeah, we're just way harder to tell if it's getting the goals that you want, you would still describe that as the goals and the capabilities are still entangled. How would you describe that case? Yeah, so I would still say in that case that the process of giving it goals and the process of giving it capabilities are entangled. I think though there can be some scenarios where it's more likely you won't notice that you're like very gradually imbuing it with goals that are pretty, pretty terrible. So I think the house cleaning case... It's relatively clear, like, if you try to use the dust minimization reward function, it's going to be this, you know, kind of gradual process of, like, oh, now it's starting to, you know, tear apart couches to, yeah. you know, find dust and stuff like that. And it's going to be clear a priori, and it's going to be increasingly clear through the process that this is bad, and yeah. you're going to, like, notice it before it's, you know, a super intelligent dust destroyer. I think if you're imagining kind of more nuanced cases where, um, yeah, maybe you're doing something where the behavior is, like, a lot harder to evaluate. I know the example that, for example, Paul Cristiano has sometimes used is a city planning AI system. It seems to be sort of structurally similar where just standard reinforcement learning with a hand reward function just isn't going like, to give you the ability to train an AI system to um, you know, plan cities well. Or like doing supervised learning over examples of like the 100 you know, big good planned cities is not going to be sufficient. And so it seems like to even have something that's kind of trying to do, let's say city planning, and like you'd ever plausibly actually want to try and like use and it would look even remotely coherent to what it's doing, you probably need some sort of progress on alignment techniques. Given that lots of the sort of downsides of, you know, let's say certain play, city plan designs are maybe harder to see than certain downsides of, let's say, a robot, you know, messing up a house. This could be a case where, yeah, to some extent, you know, alignment techniques serve as a bottleneck of trying to deploy any sort of city planning system. But maybe there's some sort of unhappy valley where you've worked out alignment techniques, you know, well enough that, like, it's not just behaving incoherently. It's actually kind of acting like it's trying to do something roughly in line with what a city planner would be trying to do. But it's not really all the way there. And you like, aren't quite able to notice that's not all the way there. That's actually doing something that's not fully on board because it's just so nuanced in terms of what the consequences are. Okay, so you've argued that the process of giving an AI goals and the process of increasing its capabilities are really entangled and sort of blurs together the sort of projects of working on alignment or goal giving and the ones of just increasing capabilities. What does this mean? Like, what's the upshot? Why is this important? Yeah, so I think one thing that means is at least like somewhat sort of turns down the, the sort of urgency knob, where if progress on alignment techniques is itself sort of a bottleneck for creating systems and putting them out into the world that we would intuitively regard as very intelligent and have like any inclination to actually use, then this means that there's not this sort of kind of exogenous time pressure of, oh, we need to like work out these techniques before this external event happens, which I think sort of smooth things out a bit. And I think it also just means to some extent that, you know, some of the, the kind of conventional stories that people tell about how AI risk could happen, like this thing that you give the goal of paperclip maximizing and then you're like, you know, sort of caught off guard by it, all of a sudden having this goal and like engaging in this radically inappropriate way. just looks even sort of more unlike what machine learning progress will probably look like than one might naively have assumed a priori. Are there people who have good objections to this line of argument? So I think it'd be relatively hard to argue at least against the idea that there's this sort of deep entanglement between doing anything of goals and making it act in a way we would intuitively regard as intelligent. I think probably the main objection you could raise would be to say basically like, okay, yeah, there's this entanglement, but even if there's this entanglement, that doesn't really resolve the issue. And I think the way you would sort of need to frame this is that there's a bit of this sort of unhappy valley 
where, um, you know, again, in the, let's say city planner case, if we just basically don't have any progress on alignment techniques, we're stuck using hand-coded reward functions or supervised learning, we're just like not going to use AI systems that are trained using those methods to try and plan cities. And I think the thing that you sort of need to think is that we'll make some amount of progress basically on alignment techniques or what are currently called alignment techniques. And it will sort of seem okay at the time. It will be like not behaving incoherently. It will look like it's trying to do the same sort of thing that a normal city planner is roughly trying to do. But we won't be all the way there. And then, you know, disaster could sort of strike in that way. I think that's sort of the main avenue you could go through. I guess the second related concern is a little bit different. Is you could think, okay, well, maybe this is an argument against us sort of naively going ahead and just sort of putting something out into the world that's sort of as extremely misaligned as like a decimal minimizer or like a paper clip maximizer. But maybe we could still get to the point where like, okay, we haven't worked out alignment techniques. And like no sane person would kind of keep running the dust minimizer simulation once it's really clear this is so not the thing we want to be making. But maybe, you know, not everyone is saying, maybe someone just wants to make a system that pursues some extremely narrow objective like this extremely effectively. And even though it would be clear to anyone with like kind of normal values that this is like, you're not in the process of making a thing that you want to like actually use. Maybe someone who wants to cause destruction could conceivably plow ahead. Gotcha. And so that might be one way of sort of maybe rescuing the deadline picture is the deadline is not when will people sort of have really intelligent systems that they sort of kind of naively throw out into the world. It's like, when do we reach the point where someone just wants to create something that's in some sense really intuitively pursuing a very narrow objective has the ability to do that. If I summed up the takeaway or part of the takeaway as the following, I want to see if I'm following it. I might say that there is an entanglement between capabilities research and research on alignment and goals such that if you're trying to make some project, so maybe it's like a, a robot vacuum, you're both going to need some level of capabilities and you're going to need some minimum level of alignment. And so there's going to be like a, a interaction loop between the two and you're going to need both. It is still possible that like the level of alignment research that you would need in order for that to work out is not at the same level as you would end up needing to like be 100% sure that it's always safe. Or you can imagine systems where the amount of alignment that you need for it to like 99% of the time work fine is not enough alignment. It's like there's still that possibility that you fall into that valley. Yeah, actually, I think one thing is probably important to clarify is I've been talking a lot about sort of alignment risk, where basically, let's say one way of defining misalignment risk is an AI system does something that we intuitively regard as very damaging. And the best explanation for it is that it was basically competently pursuing a goal or a set of goals that's a bit different than the set of goals that we have. And that's definitely not the the only way that an AI system can cause harm. You can also have a system cause harm through, you know, just some sort of means that's not really best thought of misalignment. It's like, let's say a self-driving car just veering off the road. That seems like not really like a misalignment risk. So one way you can still definitely continue to to have risks from systems, even if capabilities and goals are entangled, or a system just basically messing up in some weird way that doesn't really have to do with misalignment per se, but it's not very robust. So you imagine, you know, house cleaning robot, it's in a sense trying to do what a normal house cleaner would do, but sometimes house cleaners like accidentally set houses on fire, for example. So just to say that's, that's one avenue you can go through. And then the other one is, it can be the case that you've created something that has roughly similar goals, the sorts of goals you'd want to be having, or it has goals which look functionally similar within some narrow environment, but actually you shift to some other environment and actually the fact that they're subtly different becomes relevant. So those are two ways in which I think you could still arrive with, arrive at like a, some degree of risk, even if you accept this point that these things are entangled. Okay, so we've now talked through the point that you raised that there actually are some links between the process by which capabilities are instilled in a AI system and the process by which goals or alignment ends being engineered to an AI system. And that might mean that the model where at some particular point in capabilities and then it's necessary for the people working on alignment to like make sure that they like catch up it doesn't actually make that much sense because in order to hit a certain point in capabilities, you need it that to be enabled by the AI being aligned as well. So sort of stepping back from that set of issues, you had a third set of concerns that you want to raise about the sort of classic AI arguments. Yeah, so I suppose I have a third and maybe last objection to the way that some of these classic arguments are sometimes presented. And it has to do with what's sometimes known as the instrumental convergence thesis. And the idea, idea here is basically that you know most goals you might have, if you pursue them sufficiently effectively, will tend to lead you to engage in behaviors that most people would consider abhorrent. So again, to return to the paperclipper thought experiment, you have this goal, which is maximize paperclip production. 
And given this goal, certain things seem to follow from it. So like insofar as other people can prevent you from maximizing paperclips, that's sort of a threat to your ability to pursue the goal. So you have some sort of instrumental reason trying to accrue power to try and have influence over people to try and stop them from sort of standing in your way. You also have instrumental regions to try and just acquire resources in general, just anything that might be useful for making paperclips. And the act of just sort of pursuing power and pursuing resources without regard to things besides just paperclip production will probably lead you to do things that, you know, most people would consider abhorrent. You know, and, and same thing for, if you imagine really pushing a dust, you know, minimizer case really far forward, you know, if people are going to shut you down before you can get the last little bit of dust out of the crawl space or something, then you have reason to try and sort of have power over these people or try and acquire resources that can sort of prevent you from being shut down. If you really push it, you know, to the extreme level, if you just are trying to accrue resources, you're trying to accrue power and you have relatively narrow goals, then, and you're like sufficiently effective at doing what you're trying to do, then it seems like in loads of different cases, you'll be doing something abhorrent. And that's the basic idea of instrumental convergence. Okay, so that's the concept of instrumental convergence. And what role does it play in the classical arguments? Yeah, so I think there is the sort of an implicit argument structure, I think, that goes something like this. So I think it's something like we can, you know, think of any really advanced AI system as in some sense pursuing some set of goals quite effectively. Most set of goals it has, given that it's pursuing them very effectively, have the property that they imply the system ought to be engaging in really abhorrent behaviors, like let's say maybe harming humans to prevent you know, humans from shutting the system down. And so therefore, because we're eventually going to create systems that can pursue goals very effectively, and most goals when pursued sufficiently effectively imply abhorrent behaviors, there's a good chance that we will eventually create systems that engage in really abhorrent behaviors. And maybe just to sort of illustrate a bit how this works with a quote, there's a, a quote from a number of different Elie Zerudkowski essays where he says, for most choices of goals... Instrumentally rational agencies will predictably wish to obtain certain generic resources, such as matter and energy. The AI does not hate you, but neither does it love you, and you are made of atoms that can use for something else. But just another presentation from another Miri talk is, most powerful intelligences will radically rearrange their surroundings because they're aimed at some goals or other, and the current arrangement of matter that happens to be present is not the best possible arrangement for suiting their goals, and they're smart enough to find some and access better arrangements. That's bad news for us because most of the ways of rearranging our parts into some other configuration would kill us. So the suggestion again seems to be that because sort of most possible in some sense very intelligent systems we might create would engage in perhaps even omnicidal behaviors, we should be quite concerned about creating such systems. Okay, so is it true that we should just assume that if there is an AI and it's smart enough and it has a goal, it's just going to start going after us because we are all threats to trend? Right. So I think the, the main objection that I have to this line of thought is that if you're trying to predict what a future technology will look like, it's not necessarily a good methodology to try and think, here are all of the possible ways we might, might make this technology. Most of the ways involve property P, so therefore we'll probably create a technology with property P. Just as like some really simple sort of silly illustrations, most possible ways of building an airplane involve at least one of the windows on the airplane being open. There's a bunch of windows. There's a bunch of different combinations of open and closed windows. Only one involves them all being closed. But it'd be you know, bad to predict that we'll build airplanes with open windows. You know, most possible ways of building cars don't involve functional steering wheels that like a driver can reach. Most possible ways of building buildings involve giant holes in the floor. There's only one possible way to like have the floor not have a hole in it. So it seems to often be the case that this sort of argument schema doesn't necessarily work that well. Or another case as well is that if you think about human evolution, there's, for example, a lot of different sort of preference rankings I could have over the arrangement of sort of matter in this room. There's a lot of different sort of, in some sense, goals I could have about how I'd like the stuff in this room to be. And if you really think about it, most different sort of preferences I could have for the arrangement of matter in the room involve me wanting to sort of tear up all of the objects and sort of put them in very specific places. It's only a really small subset of the preferences I have that involve me keeping objects intact because there's a lot fewer ways for things to be intact than to be split apart and sort of spread throughout a room. But it's not really that surprising that I don't have this sort of wild destructive preference about how to arrange, you know, let's say the atoms in this room. I think the sort of general principle here is that if you want to try and predict what some future technology will look, will look like. You know, maybe there is some predictive power you get from thinking about like, oh, you know, X percent of the ways of doing this involve property P. But it's really important to think about what is the process by which this technology or this artifact will emerge? And is that the sort of process that will be sort of differentially attracted to things which are, let's say, benign? And if so, then maybe that outweighs the fact that maybe most possible designs are not benign. Got it. And so then in this particular case of AI development, do we have a good reason to think that researchers will be attracted to the possible AI systems that are more benign. Yeah, so I think that this connects a lot to 
I guess, the previous two sort of objections that we talked about. So I think one reason is I expect things to be relatively gradual. So insofar as we're creating systems that are not, you know, super benign or harmful, I expect us to notice that we're going down that path relatively early. That's to notice like various issues, like maybe AI systems engaging in deceptive behaviors or AI systems just being non-robust in important ways. And so I think that we're likely to have, at least assuming some degree of continuity, I think we're likely to have feedback loops, which would be really helpful for us, like steering us towards things that we want. And I think the last point we just discussed as well, like the sort of entanglement of capabilities and goals makes me think that we won't end up necessarily accidentally in, the, in lieu of, you know, the ability to create an aligned and sort of capable system. I think there's not necessarily a strong reason to think that we'll just go ahead and create something that's like a, you know, a dust minimizer, a paper can maximizer is quite capable, just because we don't know how to make something that's both aligned and capable. So I think those two considerations both push in the direction of, you know, the engineering processes we're following being of the sort that we won't end up crazy, crazy far away from you know, something that's doing roughly what we want to be doing. I think there's some intuition of just the gap between something that's going around, let's say, you know, murdering people and and using atoms for engineering projects and something that's doing whatever it is you want it to be doing seems relatively large. It seems like you've probably missed the target by quite some ways if you're out if you're out there. I guess one of the things that the sort of traditional instrumental convergence argument I think was sort of arguing is that like the space is just very dense with the really, really bad scenarios. And so if you sort of missed by a little bit, mm-hmm. you'd end up in an awful scenario. It seems like you think that the ones where the AI takes all of our atoms mm-hmm. are not going to be close at all to the ones where the AI successfully cleans our room. Yeah, so I think this isn't like definitely the case, but I think one intuition here is we think about machine learning systems using you know, some sort of like neural net and you imagine tweaking some of the parameters. You know, I'm not an expert, but my impression is that you typically won't get behaviors which are just like radically different or that seem like the system's just kind of going for something completely different. In some sense, this is almost the, the sort of premise behind, you know, current machine learning methods is you can like make some sort of, sort of small tweak to the, the parameters of a model, see how it goes. It won't be crazy different. It won't be the sort of like off the wall. It'll be kind of close to what's already doing. You can see like, is it a little bit better? Is it a little bit worse? And then, you know, you follow your, your way down the path towards something that's doing, you know, really the, what you want it to be doing in these small increments. So it does seem like it's kind of a property of machine learning today that, um, at least at the, the sort of weight level or like the parameter level, that small tweaks don't lead to systems which are doing something that's just radically, radically different. Although I should also say that I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on, on issues around robustness. Would we expect, like, would we be more worried if we both tweaked one of the ML systems and then also changed the context it's operating in? Changing the environment that an AI system is operating in can definitely have a substantial impact on its behavior as well. Uh, there's this general concern that AI systems often are not robust to changes in distribution. And what that means in concrete terms is that if you develop an AI system by uh, training it on experiences or data pertaining to a certain type of environment or a certain uh, type of scenario, and then you expose it to an environment or scenario that's very different than any of the ones it was trained on, uh, then its behavior might look fairly different, and especially its behavior might look a lot more incompetent or foolish or, or random. So to put this in concrete terms, if you develop, let's say, a self-driving car uh, by training it on lots of data pertaining to, let's say, good road conditions, and then uh, you take your self-driving car and you put it in off-road conditions, or you put it on, let's say, an ice road or something that's very different than any of the roads it was trained on, uh, then there's a heightened chance that will do something like veer off the road. Or if you train a a text completion system on English language text, so you train a system that's meant to, to predict the second half of a sentence, let's say, from the first half, Um, given only English sentences, and then after it's trained, you give it the first half of a sentence in Spanish. There's obviously a heightened chance I won't really know what to do with that. Um, It probably won't give a very sensible output um, in response to this Spanish half sentence. So it definitely is the case that putting an AI system in a new type of environment can substantially change its behavior. At the moment, though, what this tends to look like is just um, sort of incompetent behavior or foolish behavior or random behavior. Um, as opposed to behavior which is very, um, let's say, coherent and and competent and and potentially concerning. Um, It should be said, though, that a number of researchers, especially over the past year, and especially at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, have been developing this concept that they call MESA optimization. And I won't really get into the concept here, um, but one of the ideas which is associated with the concept is this thought that um, as machine learning systems become more sophisticated in the future, Maybe when they're exposed to new environments, they won't just behave in a way that looks um, sort of incompetent or foolish to us. Uh, They might behave in a way that still looks competent and goal-directed and intelligent, but nonetheless, the systems might act like they're pursuing a different goal than it seemed like they were pursuing in the initial class of environments that they were trained on. Um, So if that's true, then that would be something that would exacerbate the risk that, um, you know, maybe you can get out fairly different 
goal-directed behavior than than the behavior you saw during training. Okay, so you can argue that even if it is the case that most theoretical AIs one could imagine would have these instrumentally convergent goals, we still wouldn't be in a place where we should expect to be too likely that we end up with some omnicidal AI because engineers are going to use processes that are more likely to land on the things that we want than the things that we don't want. Are there counter arguments or, you know, reasons that we still ought to be concerned? Yeah, I think there are probably just like a few different classes of counter arguments. So one might be that we have these like, again, toy thought experiments we talked about earlier that might be in some way suggestive. So we have all these, you know, thought experiments where you give an AI system in some sense a goal that corresponds to maximizing paperclip production and initially seems okay to you. And then you realize that like, oh, if you follow out the implications, then, you know, it's quite negative. And there's, for example... You know, I think there's like, for example, a 10 page stretch in, in super intelligence where sort of Nick goes through a bunch of sort of English language commands where like at first glance, they seem like kind of benign things make us happy or, or things like this. And then describes, oh, even though these are kind of seem benign, if you actually sort of interpret them somewhat literally and it is single-mindedly trying to fulfill this objective, a bad thing happens. And so I think sometimes these sorts of thought experiments are used to suggest that, oh, maybe sometimes something that seems benign to you with regards to like an AI system's behavior, it will turn out not to be so benign. It's hard to tell what's what. And I guess the just the response I have to like at least that line of thinking is I still don't necessarily, I suppose, buy the idea that these thought experiments really tell us that much about, you know, what's likely to happen in the context of AI systems. You know, often it seems to be, the point is that um, if you take an English language sentence and then you um, give an agent the goal of interpreting that sentence literally and like single-mindedly without any common sense and then, you know, trying to fulfill that literal single-minded interpretation of that sentence as, you know, competently as possible, then you get bad outcomes out. But I guess I don't really, yeah, I guess I still have trouble sort of mapping it onto anything we might see in the context of AI development, because, you know, obviously we well mostly agree that like, you know, if we're training AI systems, it's going to be based probably on some sort of machine learning thing or something that's more code-based as opposed to kind of feeding in English language sentences. And even if you try and kind of think of a close analogy, so let's say we've created an AI system that takes English language commands, and then it goes off and engages in some sort of behavior. You know, it's really hard to imagine how we could have done that such that it, you know, tries to do the literal minded thing as opposed to kind of having common sensical responses to requests. So if you imagine we're training it on, let's say, data sets of people receiving English language commands and then responding to them, obviously the, the responses will be responses that like go to like the common sense interpretation. You know, someone being asked to... um let's say, you know, on, on footage, on camera, you know, help maximize a you know, paperclip factory's production isn't going to be doing the literal minded thing. Or like, you know, if you train it on, for example, Marx Brothers movies or something like that, where people do receive requests and then just horribly misinterpret them, then obviously you could get that sort of behavior out, but it doesn't seem like whatever the relevant data set is, presumably you wouldn't get that sort of thing. Or you might imagine you're training it on, you know, human feedback where you give an AI system some sort of verbal command and it does something. And then you say like how much it fulfilled what you wanted or how happy you are with the behavior it exhibited once you gave it the command, you know, presumably rewarding it for stuff that kind of exhibits common sense interpretations of your requests as opposed to literal minded ones. And so again, if we're trying to imagine like a close concrete analog of an AI system that takes English language requests and then does stuff, presumably it's not engaging in, in the sort of literal minded behavior. And so, you know, obviously no one is suggesting that, again, like AI design will really look like this, but I just have this, I suppose, issue that whenever I try to map on these thought experiments, it's like something that might actually happen in the context of AI development. I just don't really understand what the mapping is meant to be or what this actually suggests about AI design and practice. All right. So the thought experiments are one response to your argument. What are some of the others? Yeah, I think probably actually the one I imagine most people would make today, or at least most people, you know, in certain sections of the AI safety community would be one has to do with this idea of MACE optimization that I briefly alluded to before. And I, I think I actually still don't really properly understand this. There's the white paper that came out a few months ago. It's the first sort of rigorous presentation of it. And I think the idea is still to some extent being worked out, but hopefully this is relatively accurate. I think the basic idea is that you know, let's say that you're training a machine learning system and you're giving it some sort of feedback. Again, like let's return to the, the house cleaning robot case. You're giving it feedback in terms of, that's meant to correspond to um, good house cleaning behavior. And intuitively you'd expect that insofar as the system takes on goals, its goals will like map on pretty well to the sorts of feedback you're giving it. So if you're rewarding it for cleaning a house well, then you should expect the goal that it develops to essentially be to, you know, clean house as well. And then, you know, asymptotically, if you keep doing this, it will sort of, to like a greater and greater degree, like sort of have a fi high fidelity understanding of the goal that it pursues. And I think the idea with MACE optimization is there might be some sort of weird phenomenon that happens during the training process where systems take on goals that are almost 
almost in a sense, like perhaps fairly random or just like quite different than whatever is, you know, the feedback you're giving that corresponds to. And that the systems might, you know, have these almost sort of random or like quite strange goals. And at some point in the future, like be, you know, sophisticated enough to know that, oh, they should like keep the goals that they actually have secret. Because if they reveal that they have these goals, then, you know, people won't use the systems. And so they sort of play along as though they had the expected goals. But then, you know, really they have these sort of randomly generated ones. And I think I, I don't really understand the intuitions for this that much. The, the main analogy that I think people use to try and drive this is um, if you think of the case of natural selection, obviously the thing that people were basically being selected for historically is, you know, reproductive fitness. Like how good are you at passing your genes to the next generation? You can think of natural selection as this sort of feedback process that's in some way a little bit analogous to machine learning. And the sort of interesting thing is that like humans today can be said to have certain goals, but these goals are not, you know, just maximize your own reproductive fitness. People have other goals, in fact, diverge from it. Like people, you know, willingly choose to, to use birth control or to, you know, sacrifice their lives for like causes greater than themselves and things like this. So people have sort of ended up with this somewhat strange, you know, in the very suite of goals rather than just the single goal of reproductive fitness, which was the, the thing, the sort of evolutionary feedback process was selecting for. And I think people use this analogy to say like, oh, maybe we should expect, you know, future AI systems to like also in a similar way end up with a kind of strange suite of goals rather than just the thing we're training them for. And, you know, something happens where like they hide these and we don't realize it. And then, then these sort of randomly chosen goals might just by the instrumental convergence hypothesis be of the sort that, that lead them to, you know, do horrible things. So I guess in the case of evolution, the goals that, you know, we ended up with at least seem, you know, like probably still correlated with reproductive fitness. And in the context that evolution was sort of training us for, we're probably even more highly correlated with reproductive fitness. So it feels like they're not randomly chosen, but actually are at least like kind of pointing us towards the sort of original underlying goal. In the case of AI, how do they end up prioritizing these sort of other goals that you know, don't even seem to be like pointing them towards the thing that we actually want? Yeah, I think so. this connects to, I believe we previously discussed a little bit, this idea of the significance of distributional shift when you encounter some sort of experience or some environment that's different than the one that you've sort of been trained in. And I think some of the idea here is that, you know, maybe during the training process, the system has these kind of weird goals that like aren't exactly the thing that you'd expect. But um, functionally speaking, you know, the most effective way to pursue those goals is basically the same as the most effective way to pursue the goal that you would have expected it to have or that you wanted it to have. And so, you know, these things like pretty much line up, so it's not that big a deal. And then maybe you place it in a new environment that's pretty different than the one that you trained it in. And then maybe in this new environment, actually, the, the behavior suggested by the goals diverge in a way that they didn't previously. Got it. And then is there a reason why the agent would end up learning these sub goals that you know happen to overlap with what we really want in the sort of training distribution instead of learning the actual goal that we're trying to teach it yeah i think this is something i think i don't actually understand stand all that well so in the in the context of evolution it seems like you can tell a little bit of a story of like you know why is it that humans have all these sort of other goals rather than just having a goal of like you know have as many kids as possible which it seems like would evolutionarily be selected for and one potential story is not that far back in human evolution. We probably just didn't have the cognitive capacity to actually like represent this abstract idea of, you know, passing on your genes, which, you know, obviously is the thing you, you most want because you also care if, you know, your siblings pass on their genes because they're like statistically likely to have similar genes as you. And this is just like, it's pretty clear like a chimpanzee can't really represent or understand this abstraction. Like it's not really useful for like, or even maybe even feasible for like a chimpanzee to have the goal of maximizing, you know, the probability that genes will carry forward into the future. And so, you know, insofar as, you know, you have goals, it sort of makes sense that they should be things that your brain can actually sort of represent to, to some extent, which might just be like, oh, have more food, you know, have sex and things like that. You know, and I think in the concept of evolution, I guess another interesting point as well is you might imagine that like, if you kind of let natural selection run for like a longer period of time, that we have the cognitive abilities to sort of represent the concept of passing on your genes, like we know genes exist and stuff like that. Maybe you'd expect this to be something that sort of washes out, like you sort of run the selection process long enough. And then eventually you will actually end up with people who just um, have the goal that was being selected for. In the context of machine learning, I don't really have a great sense of how analogous or disanalogous. I know, like, it seems like you could run through some similar analogy of, like, maybe there's certain goals that you might want to sort of train AI systems to, in a sense, have. But the goal is, like, in some sense, quite abstract. <laughs> it's, like, maximize, you know the enactment of justice or something like that. And so you can't actually directly, if you want an AI system like 
sort of helps you, you know, achieve just outcomes in terms of criminal justice sentencing or something. You can't actually create an AI system like kind of has that goal effectively in a nuanced way. You need to create an AI system that has some cruder set of like proxy goals that sort of functionally get to do the same thing as they had this more nuanced one. You know, maybe that's like an issue that's that's in some sense recurring. But I, I really am quite vague in terms of what this in practice looks like or how the analogy works. Is there like a an efficiency argument or something where if in the training distribution there are these instrumental goals that keep getting it exactly what it wants, then in the training distribution, it won't make sense for it to like think from first principles over and over again, what is the best way to like get the actual reward. And so it might sort of might be a reason why they would evolve to just prioritize those instrumental goals over the sort of more fundamental thing. Yeah, I think that's another really good, you know, reason to, I guess, be sympathetic to this argument as well is, um, you know, again, just in the case of, you know, let, let's imagine that you were living your life and the entire thing you're thinking like throughout your life was just, you know, how do I like maximize, you know, the passing of my genes or something, or, um, you know, maybe better ones, like if you're like, let's say you're utilitarian, it's pretty well accepted that, you know, if you want to maximize global happiness or something, probably the right way to live is not like constantly every decision you make, try and run this very expensive calculation in terms of, oh, well, you know, the flow through effects of like me deciding to mow my lawn or like buy a red shirt versus a blue shirt, probably you don't actually want to, to like very directly, you know, try and figure out what actions fulfill this goal or don't. It's probably more useful to have lots of heuristics or like proxy goals or just rules of thumb that you use. And so, um, yeah, I think that's definitely one intuitive argument for why you might end up with a divergence is maybe just there's lots of simpler goals that it's easier to think about how good you're, a job you're doing that, you know, to fulfill them. And these goals are like, you know, much simpler, so it's less expensive. And also like they mostly overlap. So it's pretty fine to have these goals as well. What might objections be to this Mesa optimizer argument? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll list I guess, a, a few different ones. One is just the classic, really general. Yeah, I think of like, I think this argument still hasn't really been laid out that fully or clearly. I think it's, it is really something that's in some sense come onto the scene kind of recently in the past year in this, um, this one white paper. And I think it's still, you know, it's like a little bit tenuous as an argument. It's, it's not exactly clear how the concepts work or like what the nature of the mapping is between evolution and machine learning. That's like, I suppose, just a generic one. It doesn't really target it very effectively, but it's maybe just some initial consideration. I think more specifically, one response you might have is that, I guess, as we just discussed, it seems like one possible view is, okay, yeah, this thing, this thing will maybe happen where AI systems will in some sense have goals that are like sort of different than the ones you expect or different than sort of the thing you're directly selecting for. But also maybe the main thing that's driving this is this thing of, um, you know, an insufficiently sophisticated system can't really appropriately represent you know, necessarily the goals you want to be training it for. And if you just kind of keep training it long enough, then eventually you pass through this sort of unhappy valley where it's like sophisticated enough to kind of mess around, but not sophisticated enough to, to represent the concept. And eventually you just do converge on a system that can, you know, that's trying to do the thing you want. So that's one possible view. It's just basically if you train a thing for long enough, or if you train a thing on enough different environments to sort of cover, you know, issues around robustness, distributional shift, or you run sort of adversarial training, you know, where, um, you intentionally sort of train it on, you know, environments which are supposed to maximally reveal possible divergences. Maybe this thing just sort of washes out. And I think just like the, the last one, which I think probably is just most relevant for me, because I think I don't really have super firm views in terms of how likely this is or what the solutions to it are, is just a sort of general point. You know, if you expect progress to be quite gradual, then, you know, if this is a real issue, people should notice that this is an issue well before the point where it's catastrophic. We don't really have examples, I think, of this, you know, so far, but if it's an issue, then, you know, it seems like intuitively one should expect some sort of indication of this sort of interesting goal divergence or some sort of indication of this interesting phenomenon of like this new kind of robustness to distribution of shift, shift failure before it's at the point where things are totally out of hand. And, you know, if that's the case, then, um, you know, people presumably, or like hopefully won't just plow ahead creating systems that keep failing in this like kind of horrible, confusing way. And we'll also have, you know, plenty of warning that they need to work on on solutions to it. So there's a set of counter arguments usually grouped under the phrase treacherous turn. Do you want to explain what's going on there? Yes, this is one potential counter that I think, you know, you might make the thing I just said of like, oh, well, you know, if Mesa optimization is a problem, but stuff is gradual, then you should notice that this is an issue and you should like, you know, have time to work on it and also not plow ahead blindly being oblivious to this. And uh, treacherous turn arguments are just basically arguments that, you know, systems have incentives to hide the fact that their goals diverge from the ones you'd like them to have insofar as they think that if you knew the goals that they had, you know, were different than the ones you have, you'd try and shut them down or change them. 
And so the suggestion here is sort of like, well, maybe actually you wouldn't notice that this this is an issue because any system that has goals that are importantly different to the MESA optimization will you know have incentives to hide that fact because it doesn't want to be shut down and it wants to be able to, you know, left sort of free to pursue that goal. And so it will hide that and you won't really notice the MESA optimization is like an issue until it's too late. And I think just basically, yeah, I guess the response here, which is similar to, to something you know I talked about earlier in the podcast, is um again, if you do imagine things would be gradual, then it seems like before you encounter like any attempts at deception that have globally catastrophic or like existential significance, you probably should you know expect to see some amount of either like failed attempts at deception or attempts at deception that you know exist but they're not you know totally totally catastrophic. You, sh- you should probably see some systems doing this thing of like hiding the fact that they have different goals and notice this before you're at the point where you know things are just so so competent that they're able to say destroy the world or something like that. And does the Treacherous turn argument depend on the system being deceptive, or could it just be that it has goals that we're perfectly happy with in the context of systems at sort of one level of capabilities, but then there sort of is a distributional shift when you move to a higher level of capabilities, so that same set of goals is something that we're unhappy with. So I don't think that the issue depends on... I guess there being this intentional hiding of the divergence. The thing is, like, if there's not an intentional hiding of the divergence, it seems even dramatically more likely that you should notice this issue when you, like, expose systems to, like, changes in distribution. If there's no intentional hiding of this, then it seems surely if stuff is gradual, you'll notice this kind of interesting way of responding to the distributional shift before you're at the point where individual systems can destroy the world. And so the thing that, you know, the system actually hiding it is sort of this ingredient that's sort of necessary to make it, you know, somewhat plausible that, that, that you can find another side. How about things are less gradual? Yeah, I mean, I think just in general, if you ramp up the, if you turn up the sort of discontinuity knob, then, you know, all these considerations become weaker and weaker. So the more rapid things are, the less of a window of time there is to notice that there are issues or, um, you know, the fewer systems that exist in the world that like, are quite significant, the fewer sort of instances or like opportunities to notice this phenomenon exist, or the fewer, you know, possible chances of catching something in substance behavior exist. And also, it's like the less time you have to work on or find solutions. So just in general, the more discontinuous you make things, the less certain it becomes that like, oh, yeah, you'll notice this issue in like a weaker form or like, oh, you know, you'll have time to, to you know, do stuff that's relevant to this. I guess also it might be the case that if things are more discontinuous than the more advanced system that you deploy will be more and more dissimilar from the previous ones. Right, right. So it's, it's definitely like, you know, it's less likely, it's more likely any problem you see will have a close analog in the previous versions. And I guess just, you know, one last one thrown as well that we discussed before is if stuff's more just, you know, continuous and probably like, you know, there's a lot more like AI systems that exist in the world and probably some of them are useful for constraining the behavior of others or noticing issues or helping you do AI research in like a, you know, not super messed up way. <laughs> and again, yeah, I think this just really comes down to like, if stuff is sufficiently continuous and capabilities are sufficiently distributed, I have a lot of trouble understanding like how this would happen, how you'd get to the point where an individual system is like powerful enough to like destroy the world. You haven't already noticed that you have this issue with AI design where you're creating things which are accidentally, you know, accidentally like extremely deceptive in this way. I think this is something that makes maybe more sense when you're imagining something like the brain in a box scenario where you have this thing that's very different than anything you've ever had before. It's sort of sitting on a hard drive. You have no experience actually like using this sort of thing out in the world. You maybe run some tests in a lab or something and the thing is like, it's already, it's jumped to like clever in the way that humans clever and sort of hides what's going on there. But when I imagine progress as this like very distributed thing, it's very gradual, then I have a lot, I have a lot of trouble basically understanding kind of how this works and how this sort of deception goes unnoticed. What's the argument that there should have been deception in earlier versions of AI? Were this to be the case? Like why should this deception have been noticed earlier? I mean, so we already have, I guess I discussed a bit earlier, like some low level versions of deception, like this system, this robotic, you know, gripper system that pretended to be gripping a thing when really it wasn't. And it seems like if this is just kind of a characteristic of AI research is like, oh, accidentally, when you're training a system, this is a thing that happens quite frequently is like it has some other goal and then it hides that from the overseer. Then it seems like if this is a likely enough characteristic and you have loads and loads of systems out in the world, you have you know, millions of you know, various ML systems of like various uses and capabilities. It seems like you should be noticing that that's like a property of how you're developing AI systems. I have trouble imagining a world where let's say things unfold over you know, decades and there's this gradual expansion of capabilities that no one really notices this is a serious issue up until the point where you live in a world where an individual AI system can sort of, let's say, destroy the world on its own. There's something we do, you could say, which is you don't start seeing lying until you start to get AIs that are capable enough that they're able to, with high confidence, get away with their lies. 
Does that seem more possible to you? So again, I don't, I don't really think so. So to some extent, the scraper case is an example of a thing lying and not getting away with it. And then even if, let's say, things can get away with it, let's say 90% of the time, if you have loads and loads of systems, then eventually you're going to yeah, see some that catch it. And yeah, I mean, you know, maybe this is not a fair analogy, but, you know, children, for example, are examples of slightly cognitively impaired agents that lie a whole bunch of the time, even though they, they you know, quite frequently get caught. One thing you probably learn to do is actually, like, learn how to lie. Like, probably this is something that you don't get good at until you've actually have experience lying, I would imagine. I think there's also this other sort of objection to the treacherous turn idea is it seems to be this, this story where if we end up with a system that is in a position to like destroy the world and it has a goal to like do something that implies it should destroy the world, then we may have you know, sort of trouble running tests and notice that. But it's not in and of itself an explanation of why we should even have ended up in that scenario in the first place, like why we were in this world where we have a thing that wants to destroy the world. And like, is that capable as well? So at most it says it would be very difficult to actually test it because it will be behaving in the lab just as it's best to get its goals to behave in the lab, which is not involved doing anything terrible. Yeah, I think another element as well, although I'm like, definitely I think this is like a less robust point, is again, if you're imagining at least the, the fairly continuous scenario, then at least in, in that world, you know, maybe you have lots of tools that, that you, we don't have today to sort of probe the behavior of AI systems. You have lots of AI-enabled capabilities where you can use AI systems to sort of like, you know, suss out certain traits of other ones, which might also help with the issue and make actually, you know, I have no idea, but... It's not necessarily clear just because if an AI system dropped, you know, on Earth today that was super intelligent, it would be hard to sort of figure out if it was deceptive. But that doesn't necessarily mean that in the world would be in the future that it actually would be that hard to, we actually would lack the tools to figure out what's going on there. Okay, so we've now been through three different objections that you've had to some of the premises of the classic AI risk arguments. Do you want to take a step back and ask, I don't know, like, what did this all mean and figure out where this leaves us? Yeah, so I think, so first of all, there's this high-level landscape of arguments that, you know, AI poses other risks or opportunities that have long-run significance that sort of, like, warrant us really prioritizing it over er other areas today. And there's a few different, obviously, reasons for that, a lot of which, which we discussed earlier, don't necessarily have to do with technical safety issues. So AI being destabilizing, for example, doesn't really hinge on, you know, these particular arguments about AI safety posing a existential risk. And then within the context of sort of safety or technical considerations, there's like a little bit of a landscape of arguments. So here I've been basically mostly focused on what I'm kind of calling the classic arguments. It's really like a class of arguments that was mostly worked out in sort of the mid-2000s. And that's most prominently sort of talked about in superintelligence, although superintelligence also talks about other things related to AI. And so I also think a class of arguments that has, I think, been especially influential. Like I think a lot of people I know who took an interest in AI risk took an interest in it because they read superintelligence or because they read, you know, essays by Elijah Yukowski or they read other things which are in some sense derivative of these so I've sort of in, in some sense been talking about what I think are the most sort of extensively described and most influential arguments. But I think it's also important to say that beyond that, there's also sort of other classes of arguments that people are sort of toying with, or the other arguments that people have gestured at. So for example, I would list like Paul Cristiano as an example of an AI safety researcher who does actually like, I would say, you know, does reject like a number of the premises that show up in the classic arguments. For example, he, I know that he expects progress to be relatively continuous and has expressed the view that you might expect AI to present an existential risk, even if stuff is relatively continuous, even if you don't really have this strong separation between capabilities and goals. And then there's also this other research just in the past year by myriad researchers on this idea of MESA optimization, which I, I sort of vaguely gestured at, which sort of does go above and beyond the arguments that show up in superintelligence and sort of older essays by Elias Yudkowsky. We also have people like Wei Dai, who've also written some blog posts expressing somewhat different perspectives on why alignment research is useful. So I do want to say there's, a, there's this sort of this big constellation of, of arguments that people have put forward. I think my overall perspective, at least on the safety side of things, is that I basically, at, at this point, although I found them quite convincing when I first encountered them, now obviously have like a number of qualms about the presentation of the classic arguments. I think there's a number of things that sort of don't really go through or that really need to be maybe like adjusted or elaborated upon more. And on the, other, on the other hand, there are these other arguments that have emerged sort of more recently, but I think they haven't really been described in a lot of detail. Like a lot of them really do come down to, you know, it's a couple of blog posts written in the past year. I think if, for example, if the entire case for treating AI as an existential risk sort of hung on these blog posts, I wouldn't really feel comfortable, let's say, advocating for like millions of dollars to be going into the field or, you know, loads and loads of people to be changing their careers, which sort of seems to be happening at the moment. And I think, yeah, I don't know. I think that basically we're in a state of affairs where there's a lot of plausible concerns about AI. There's a lot of different angles you can come from, from saying like, this is something that we ought to be working on from a long-term perspective. But at least I'm somewhat uncomfortable about the state of arguments that have been published. I think where the things are more rigorous or more fleshed out, I don't really agree with that much. And the things that I may be more sympathetic to just haven't been fleshed out that much. 
just getting down to like a bit more precisely, you found some objections to the superintelligence classic arguments. How decisive do you think those are? How important to them are, to the story are they? Like they, they might just be making the story more plausible and it's like, oh, well now there are a bunch of different ways that the story could go wrong versus they might just mean there's no reason at all to think that we're going to end up in this scenario. I want to ask something like how much weight are you putting on this? Yeah. So I think maybe a rough analogy is like, imagine that, you know, like a proof has been published for some mathematical theorem. And then you sort of look at the proof and you know, it's, well, okay, so here's like um, an assumption that's used in the proof. And actually, I don't think that assumption's right. And then here's this place where some conclusions derived, but actually it's not really clear to me. There's some missing steps. Maybe, you know, the author had a clear sense of like what the steps were, but at least me as a reader, like I can't quite fill them in. And so I think if you find yourself in a position like that with regard to a mathematical proof, it is reasonable to be like, well... Okay, so like this exact argument sort of isn't necessarily getting the job done when it's sort of taken quite at face value. But maybe I still see some of the intuitions behind the proof. Maybe I still think that, oh, okay, you can actually like remove this assumption. Maybe you actually don't need it. Maybe you can swap this one out with another one. Maybe this gap can actually be filled in. So I definitely don't think that, you know, be right in this sort of context to say like, oh, you know, I have qualms. I think there are holes. I think there are assumptions to disagree with. Therefore, like the conclusion is wrong. I think the main thing it implies, though, is we're not really in a state where at least a few sort of accept the objections I've raised we really have good, tight, rigorous arguments for the conclusion that AI presents this large existential risk from a safety perspective. I think basically what that, that essentially means in practice is that we ought to be putting a lot of resources into trying to figure out, is there a risk here? What does the risk look like? We ought to be like extremely wary. Anytime that someone raises a concern that something could pose an existential risk, you ought to take that extremely seriously, even if you don't necessarily think that the, the argument is right. But at the same time, you shouldn't necessarily, I suppose, treat it as settled or at the same time necessarily commit to putting like too, too many resources into the area before you've really kind of worked out the structure of the arguments. Yeah, just, just as a quick analogy, you can imagine, you know, in the context of an issue like climate change or a pandemic preparedness, we would obviously feel quite weird about it if, you know, the argument for like climate change being a real phenomenon hinged on a couple of blog posts or, you know, conversations with generalists or, or one book that a lot of people have sort of, you know, moved away from. We'd obviously view that, you know, in lots of other areas like a not really satisfactory state of affairs. And so I think probably we should, you know, have the same attitude in the context of AI. How much less weight do you put on the AI risk argument now than you did a year and a half ago or something? I would say probably a lot less. I don't know exactly what that means. So I first became interested basically in in the area by actually reading superintelligence, actually at the time finding it quite, at least the, there's a lot of stuff in there on like basically different ways that AI could be important from a long-term perspective. But at least I found the, the arguments about you know, some single agent sort of causing havoc, quite convincing. And that was sort of my main main reason, basically, for getting interested in the topic and thinking like, oh, wow, this could be like, you know, a really, really large thing. And yeah, I don't really know exactly, like, you know, how to put a number on it. But I think maybe it's roughly an order of magnitude drop in terms of how likely it is, I think, that there will be existential, essentially, like safety failures. My level of interest and concern about other pathways by which AI could be significant from a long run perspective have, I think, gone up a decent amount, but I think not enough to um, sort of compensate from, you know, the, I guess, the drop in my credence in sort of existential accidents happening. And that's, that's obviously like a super, you know, for the most part, a super good thing. It's like, oh, wow, like I thought that this, you know, like an order of magnitude drop in, in terms of um, your, your credence in doom is obviously pretty nice. Are the classical arguments doing any work for you at all at this point? Like if you learned actually... There's just like not, nothing worthwhile in the book anymore in super intelligence. Do you think that that would much change your views? I actually don't think, I don't think it would do that much. I think a lot of my, the weight of my concern about sort of existential safety failures really does sort of come down to this really general high level argument that I sketched at the beginning of just, yeah. we know there are certain safety issues. It seems relatively likely these advanced systems will be like crazy powerful in the future. Maybe the danger scales up in, in, in some way. Yeah, so you start to talk a little bit about how much of sense it makes to put EA resources into AI safety, given that the field has changed a bunch. You're working on AI work. Do you have like a opinion about the ways in which this should change the role AI plays in EA's portfolio? So I think a view that I probably have at the moment is if you imagine like choosing a topic to work on, there's a big multiplier if you're working on an area that you find intrinsically fascinating or that you feel like your natural talents or skills are like well set up to do, or if you already have really good networks in the area and a lot of background in it. And so something I feel pretty comfortable saying is, you know, if someone is, let's say, an ML researcher, or like they're really interested in machine learning, and they are really interested in sort of the long term perspective in, choos- in terms of choosing their career, I think it's probably like a really good decision for them to, to take an interest in alignment research and work on it. And similar for people working in the governance space, who have a strong interest in computer science, or machine learning, or, you know, who've already sort of built up careers there. 
I think the point I would probably go to is when it comes to people who have, let's say, a number of different options before them, and maybe working on something having to do with AI governance or AI safety isn't the most natural thing for them. Maybe they have a strong interest in like biology and they're sort of maybe leaning towards working on bio-risk. Maybe they have certain in, you know, an interest in, let's say, the economics of institutions or trying to think about you know, better ways to design institutions or make government decisions go better, or they're working on reducing sort of, let's say, tail risks from climate change or something like that. I would probably be uncomfortable, given the current state of arguments, encouraging someone to switch from the area where they feel like a more natural inclination to work on AI stuff. And I'm a bit worried that sometimes the EA community sends a signal that, oh, you know, AI is the most important thing. And it's the most important thing by like such a large margin that even if you're doing something else that seems like quite good, that's pretty different, you should switch into it. I basically feel like I would really want the arguments to like much more sussed out and much more sort of well analyzed before I really feel comfortable advocating for that. Do you know what it would mean for the arguments to be more sussed out? Yeah, so I, th I think there's a few things. So one is just, as I sort of gestured, there are a number of sort of alternative presentations of the risk that have sort of appeared online in like various blog posts or short essays that haven't yet received a treatment that's anywhere near as long or rigorous as, you know, for example, like superintelligence. And obviously, a full-length academic book is a high bar, but I do think it's pretty, it shouldn't be that, that, that arduous to sort of go beyond what exists right now. So one example of a thing, like a research trend I'd be really, really interested in is... For example, Paul Cristiano has a blog post presenting sort of an alternative framing of AI risk called, I think, What Failure Looks Like. And there was a, re a response to it, a criticism by the economist Robin Hansen, basically saying that it seems like what this argument is doing is it's taking this classic sort of econ problem of like principal agent problems, where the idea here, just for background, is like, there are often cases where you want to delegate some tasks to some other worker, like you, you know, rather than like fixing your own health, you hire a doctor who's meant to like help diagnose you, or rather than building a house yourself, you hire some builder. And sometimes the person you've hired has goals that are a little bit different than yours or incentives are a bit different than yours. And you're not in like a perfect position to like monitor their behavior or sort of figure out how good a job they're doing. And sometimes issues arise there. Like, you know, a doctor will over, over prescribe pills or like a mechanic will ask you to like, you know, pay for some, you know, servicing that your car doesn't actually need. And the way like Robin Hansen characterized as like Paul's, I think, presentation of AI risk is that sort of basically saying like, take principal agent problems, imagine agents who are just way, way smarter than the agents we have today. That means in a world where like you have principal agent problems and agents are smarter, that's a potentially disastrous world. And, you know, Hansen's criticism was there's nothing in the principal agent literature that, that suggests it's worse to have a smarter agent. Like it's not necessarily worse to have a smarter doctor or a smarter mechanic. Paul responded with a critique of that, of that critique of his arguments and then things sort of fizzled out to some extent. And for example, both those people like are extremely, you know, busy researchers in, di in different fields. But I do think this is the sort of thing where like this sort of argument shouldn't just consist of a couple of blog posts that sort of fizzle out. You know, fizzle out. We're really going to be, for example, using this sort of framing as the main justification for treating like misalignment as an existential risk. You know, it's worth someone actually like diving into the principal agent literature or sort of like trying to write it up in a way that if this is a mischaracterization of it, it's like it's clear that that's a mischaracterization of it. It shouldn't just sort of stop at the level of one 10 minute read blog post and then one five minute read criticism of that blog post. But the structure of this, if somebody wanted to go ahead and do this, would it be like apply for an EA grant or something and then be a person who's just going across the literature and trying to like write up stuff that's half written up or like resolve these tensions between different posts? Is like that the type of thing? Yeah. So I think that could be a really good way to do it. I think even if it's not like a really full-on project, like I actually do just think if there's anyone who, um, let's say happens to be sort of sufficiently familiar with the sort of existing debates or happens to be relatively familiar with some, you know, basic econ concepts and happens to have, I don't know, five hours of, of free time a week, then, you know, even just having like a 20-page blog post might be better than a 10-page one or like, you know, multiple blog posts trying to illuminate the same thing. So I think there's certain things that just, I don't think it's that arduous to necessarily go beyond it. Other things you have in mind just for like things that would be, make a big improvement to the AI risk discussion? Yeah, I think so... This, this is actually, I think, quite connected to um, uh, the thing I just said. I do think it would actually be kind of useful if even if there's some sort of like reinventing the wheel phenomenon of just like more people trying to like write down the way that they understand the case for AI risk or what motivates them personally. Like I think that there's actually a lot of heterogeneity today in terms of AI safety researchers and sort of how they frame the problem to themselves. You know, even though I've just spent a whole bunch of time talking about these sort of classic arguments, I think that lots of people have very different pictures of the risk. And a lot of these things are, I think, you know, sort of in people's heads or in sort of private Google Docs or things like that. And this is obviously like a really large ask because people are doing important time consuming work. But I do think it would be really cool if more people sort of took the time to try and write up basically their own personal worldviews around AI risk or their own personal sort of version of the narrative just to try and like get a clearer sense of like what actual arguments, you know, are sort of out there. I think there's also something really nice that happens when debates move from the level of conversation to the level of sort of written arguments. Like I think it's a really common phenomenon that 
there's something that you think is clear or something that you think is like a really tight argument. And then you try and write it down formally. You know, it's like, oh, there's actually this thing that's a little bit of a missing gap. Or you put it out in public and there's someone who read it who you would never would have talked to in person who has some interesting angle or objection. So I really just would like to see more stuff making its way into to basically text. Okay, so maybe to sum up the situation is there's still some very high level arguments for why it might be really valuable for people who care about the long-term future to work on AI. A lot of them just come from the fact that it's not that often that there's a technology that comes around that even has the potential of having the impact of something like the Industrial Revolution. That's still the case even if some of the specific arguments for AI being an extinction risk, you know, like, look a lot less strong after they've been examined. So I guess that's my summary, at least, of the story on the AI risk part. I think that there's just, like, a second part to this story where I think, like, people that I've talked to, my experience was, like, reading a bunch of your work and feeling like I couldn't understand how either I hadn't seen some of these issues before or just how, given that this is a book that's gotten, like, a lot of attention and that a lot of people have made big life changes on, I hadn't seen more discussion of these counter-arguments. And so I'm just curious if you have thoughts on, like, I don't know, like, how surprised should we be? Was it reasonable to yeah. say there haven't been any counter-arguments over the last five years that seem that persuasive? I should be, like, pretty certain. Is it even true that there weren't persuasive counter-arguments? Yes, yeah, so, like, what's your take on this whole situation? Yeah, so I think one thing that's a bit surprising is I think the book actually... So when Superintelligence came out, I think there actually weren't that many sort of detailed good-faith critiques of it. So there definitely were a number of people who, you know, wrote articles criticizing it. I think often they didn't really engage closely or they, they, for example, made arguments I think can be relatively easily swallowed down. So like one that you, for example, that we talked about earlier that you often see is people saying like, oh, if it's so smart, why is it doing this dumb thing of like, you know, turning the world into paper clips, which is sort of knocked down and discussed in depth in the context of the orthogonality thesis. I think there are probably a few people I would sort of call out for having written sort of, I suppose, like much more substantive critiques of superintelligence than most other people. I think these would be especially Robin Hansen and Katja Grace. So Robin Hansen, he engaged in, um, back in 2008, this really long series of back-and-forth blog posts with Elias Rudkowski on questions around AI development trajectories, and I think made a number of, of arguments I think actually still hold up fairly well. I think, you know, present the case for, for example, AI progress being largely driven by things like compute and, you know, gradual piecemeal algorithmic improvements, which seems in my mind to have held up pretty well. Katja Grace also has a couple of blog posts that I think make arguments that are relatively similar to some of the arguments I've just made in the context of this interview that I think, sort of unfortunately, for whatever reason, don't seem to have gotten, gotten that much attention. One other person I suppose I would mention as well is I think Brian Tomasic also has one fairly long blog post I think also makes somewhat similar arguments I think, unfortunately, also isn't, isn't all that well known. I actually think I don't really have a too clear of a sense of why some of these critiques haven't had more influence than they have. I think just maybe just for whatever reason, most people didn't end up becoming aware of them or reading them. Although I don't, that's a bit mysterious to me as well. I think there's also some aspect as well of, you know, why it is that there weren't sort of more active criticisms of or sort of critiques of these arguments in the community. I think one dynamic at play is that I think this is a bit unfortunate. I think people often, you know, have the sense that in terms of these sorts of arguments that, you know, maybe they're not an expert enough on the topic to sort of like really understand it. Or maybe there are missing pieces, but there's the sense that there's sort of other people in the community who have probably thought of those missing pieces and it just hasn't really made its way into the work. And so I think sometimes people you know, maybe just may have like not felt sufficiently secure to move from, I don't quite understand this, to, you know, maybe there's actually a missing piece. And also there may have been some sense of, um, it just is a common dynamic in the community of not all of the arguments really making their way into print, that like, oh, maybe there's, you know, some Google Doc or somewhere that clears it all up. So like, it's not really worth me raising because it's just sort of the people with access to this stuff kind of understand it, which I think is a really unfortunate dynamic. Yeah, the fact that nobody can know if they've done a thorough job catching up on the literature, I think for a lot of people who don't feel comfortable putting their neck out, unless they like, yeah. know that nobody else has made this point, yeah. that's like a really big problem. Yeah, I think it's also probably like a somewhat cyclical thing as well, where um, kind of people notice that these arguments have been like pretty widely accepted. And so they're sort of like, oh, I guess they've been you know, really heavily vetted, I suppose. Yeah. It's like an information cascade type of thing going yeah. on, I think. Where yeah, and you can have some sort of feedback loop. I, I think probably a third thing I'd point to, it's sort of a generic property, is I think a lot of these arguments, we're talking about something that's like very opaque to us, of like the future of you know AI and what these AI systems look like. When they're using concepts which we really don't have a very great grip on, like intelligence and goals, optimization power, and, and things like this. I think it's actually often really hard when an argument is using fairly abstract, kind of slippery concepts about something that's mysterious to us to really be able to quite articulate when you, you're sort of suspicious what exactly the root of your suspicion is. 
um, would really sort of cleanly say, you know, what the issue is. And one analogy that I sometimes use is if you look at Zeno's you know, paradox, there's this argument, you know, from like ancient Greece that motion's impossible. And this is an argument where like, it's really, really clear the argument's wrong. If you look into it, it's like a three-stage argument. It's not that many moving pieces. And it wasn't really until circa 1900 that I think there was a really clear description of like what was wrong with the argument. And the thing that it sort of took was the introduction of certain concepts like Cartesian coordinates and like infinite sums to like actually really be able to say what was going on. Partly people just didn't really have the mathematical crisp concepts to talk about motion. And until they had those, you just couldn't really say what was wrong with it. I guess if you imagine like a version of Zeno's paradox where like the conclusion wasn't obviously wrong and like it wasn't just a three-step thing, you know, you can easily imagine the sort of thing just going really, the flaws being unnoticed for a really long time. And so I think, yeah, just sometimes I think people underestimate how hard it is to, to actually articulate issues with, with arguments that use somewhat fuzzy concepts. Does that mean that we should have been more sympathetic to some of the earlier criticism of superintelligence, where it just seemed like there were a lot of people who really disagreed with the book, and the arguments that they gave just like didn't seem very good, seemed like very good arguments. It felt like they like didn't quite understand where superintelligence was coming from. And so I think I felt pretty dismissive of them because I felt like I could like point to the, like the problems yeah. in the arguments. Should we be thinking of those more as gestures at some real problem that might be there and take those types of things more seriously? Yeah, I think I'm a bit conflicted here. So on, on the one hand, I do definitely have sympathy through the idea that like if someone makes a criticism and the response to the criticism is sort of in your book of like, oh, here's like your orthogonality thesis, you shouldn't necessarily give that criticism much weight. But I do think you should probably take it seriously that it's at least evidence that people have this intuitive common sense, like, oh, there's something wrong here. Like, this is like a bit off. And especially, it seems like this incre- the extent to which people have this reaction also seem to to some extent correlate with how familiar people were with machine learning, although obviously not, not perfectly. There's loads of like, you know, extremely prominent machine learning researchers who like, you know, are quite concerned about this stuff. And I suppose I do, um, I do sort of have this intuition that the more an argument relies on sort of fuzzy concepts or the more an argument discusses something that we really have very little familiarity with or really very little contact with, the less we should be inclined to give weight to these arguments. The more, you know, suspicious we should be like, oh, maybe we're just not using the right concepts or maybe there's some flaw that we can't quite articulate. And the more we should potentially lean back on sort of arguments that sort of come from common sense intuition or reference class forecasting. And these sorts of arguments, for example, would just include the argument, well, we normally work out safety issues over time as things go on, which a lot of people have made, or like, well, that seems really bad. Like, why would we make something that's like that bad? Which in some sense just sounds like very dumb because like anyone can make these arguments. But I do actually think that they do actually deserve weight and they especially deserve weight when they're sort of up against things that maybe they're more rigorous or more sort of sophisticated, but they're relying on these sort of concepts we haven't really worked out. I think we're going to have to leave it there for now. Thank you so much, Ben Garfinkel, for being on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. This, is, this has been really fun. So we were going back over the recording of this episode, and Ben wanted me to inform you that there was a point that he really regretted not making, and so we added it in at the end. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to add in a little bit of additional perspective that I didn't get a chance to slip in. And it's that uh, back in 2017, there's this movie called The Boss Baby that came out starring Alec Baldwin as a talking baby who's also a boss. And I believe if you add up all of the money that was spent making this movie and marketing it, then it adds up to quite a bit more than has ever been spent on um, long-term oriented AI safety or AI governance research. And so I do want to make it clear that insofar as I've expressed, let's say, some degree of ambivalence about how much we ought to be prioritizing AI safety and AI governance today, my sort of implicit reference point here is to things like um, pandemic preparedness or nuclear war or climate change, just sort of the best bets that we have for for having a long run social impact. So I think if you ask a separate question, um, are we putting enough resources as a society or as a species into AI safety and AI governance research? Um, I think that the answer is just obviously, obviously no. I think it'd be really hard to argue that they weren't, let's say, uh, less than five boss babies worth of funding and effort. And so I do just want to make that clear that um, when it comes to how much we ought to prioritize these areas, at least five boss babies is my stance. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Just a reminder that we've put links to a few presentations by Ben Garfinkel in the show notes, uh, which I've personally really enjoyed reading. And if you want more, uh, there's additional resources in the page associated with this episode. There's also, as always, our job board at 80,000hours.org slash jobs if you're looking to find the next step in your career that can help you improve the world in a really big way. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris, audio mastering by Ben Cordell. Full transcripts are available on our site and made by Zachy Allhack. Thanks for joining. Talk to you again soon.